This is Tom Gardner representing the Computer History Museum at the offices of Oida Venture Capital. Uh, we're here to interview Jesse Oida, uh, who has a long and distinguished career in storage products, particularly in tape. Uh, Jesse started as a young engineer at IBM in the 50s, rose to a, a product manager, which is a distinguished management position in IBM, and then founded Storage Technology Corporation, which he led into the 80s. Since then, he's been dabbling in venture capital and, I should say, been in venture capital and dabbling in golf. Uh, Jesse, uh, tell us a little bit about your background, uh, where, you, where you grew up, uh, how you decided to get into engineering. Well, I was born in Palestine in a small village called Rafidia. And uh, when I was about one year old, my family moved from that little village into Haifa, which is a bigger town. And uh, I grew up actually in Haifa. And I was there up until 1948 when, you know, that part of the world was always troublesome. There's always something going on, fighting here and fighting there. It was not a peaceful place. But anyway, in 48, I left there, left Haifa, uh, went to the area where I was born. We have some relatives there. Then I said, gee, I was looking for something to do. Now, I got to add that I was still in high school, just finishing high school. Then I got a job. Um, it was kind of interesting how I uh, applied for a job with Aramco, Amer Ar Ar Arabian American Oil Company in Saudi Arabia. And uh, I was lucky I got the job to do office work. Of course, I was, I guess, 18, 19 years old. It was a great adventure. So I went there. And uh, but before I get too far, let me just mention that my, my parents were born in the Jerusalem Nablus area. My father is Nablus, my mother is from the Jerusalem area. And uh, so the family goes back many generations who lived in that part of the world. Uh, I am uh, one out of four sons. My parents have only four boys, no, no, no daughters. And uh, I'm the youngest of uh, my brothers. So uh, in 48, with the fighting going on there, uh, we all, all the, all the young people left. We went, my two oldest brothers went to Egypt, uh, my third brother went to Jordan, then I went to the, the Nab Nablus area. But my parents stayed in Haifa. Uh, they didn't leave there until they decided that their kids are not gonna come back there, so they went to live in, again, near Nablus, where the area where I was born. So anyway, then I, as I was saying, I got a job at the Aramco doing clerical work. It was very enjoyable. I mean, I it was a, it didn't do much of anything. I was just in school. And uh, they were looking for people who are maybe young and aggressive and willing to do, to work in that environment where they have out in the desert. It was really desert. I mean, where we were, it was, temperature gets up to about 120 degrees. And uh, it's a, uh, but it was a good paying job. While I was there, I met two young engineers who were working in the oil company doing petroleum type engineering work. And uh, it sounded like really exciting stuff they were doing. I said, yeah, I really should go out and study engineering. So uh, I applied to several colleges here in the United States. And I was lucky enough, I got accepted by all of them. They all around the Philadelphia area. Uh, then I decided I'd like to go to Swarthmore. I'd like to practice a small college. And uh, it, it kind of appealed to me. So I uh, got a visa and came to, to go to College of Swarthmore. 
Now, the reason I applied Wolf Scholarships around Philadelphia is because I have an uncle who was living in Philadelphia, and he suggested those scholarships to me. And uh, so I, I came, and uh, I went to Swarthmore, and I... Uh, Swarthmore is a small liberal arts college, but they do have an engineering program. So I studied engineering at Swarthmore. And uh, for a kid who was, you know, went to college in some foreign country, did not uh, do all the requirements, but I did enough of them that uh, it was a little bit, had to work hard to do well. But I, I did very well. Actually, I got on the, on the dean's list. And because of that, I was able to get the scholarship. So the money I had saved to go to college was good enough for one year, not for four years. So I had to, I was looking for to be able to work in, which I did. I worked summers and I got scholarship and I was able to, to uh, pay for my education. Uh, I think in my second year, I, uh, another student and myself got into making and selling summary sandwiches to the students in there. And that was a very thing we did. Um, it is funny, anybody who was at college at that time, and you know, some really very important people, still remember the fact that they enjoyed those summary <laughs> sandwiches we were making and selling. The college had a snack bar, and uh, they gave it every year as a scholarship to two students to run, and any profit they make is theirs. But the, in my senior year, they gave it to me. Because the year before that, the two guys did not do good. They couldn't get along, they did not make any money, and so they gave it to me. But one person, they gave it to me to run. It was very, I ran it very well. I helped pay part of the tuition, and ended up actually graduating with cash in my pocket, which was, was very, very nice. Now, at the time, while I was a Swarthmore, I, uh, I met this young lady, and then after graduation, we get married. Uh, her name was Maria, and uh, we still married. And uh, so that's what, what now, it's like 61 years uh, since after we got married. Congratulations. Well, that's thank you, thank you. That's quite an accomplishment. <laughs> yeah. uh, so I, uh, and she kind of helped me in that snack bar, what we call that, uh, that, uh, So you were an entrepreneur even then? Well, you know, I guess I was looking for ways to make a buck, I guess, at that time. Then I joined IBM. After graduating, IBM offered me a job, and I joined IBM at, at Poughkeepsie. And Maria, we got married, and she wanted to teach school. Her major was history. She got a job at, we, we both lived in New Paltz, New York. I, was commuting to Poughkeepsie to go to my job, and she was she had a job on on the other side of the Hudson, in Milton, New York. So we were there for quite a while. And then we moved from from uh, um, New Paltz to Poughkeepsie, and uh, very uh, we rented a place. Then we bought a house, all near where IBM is in Poughkeepsie. Um, Let's see. I guess with time, we had four kids. Then we had one more, so five. Four about the same age, and then many years later, we have the fifth one. And so we have five children right now, and uh, we currently have 11 grandchildren. They're all growing up fast. You know, uh, so at IBM, my first job was to do some mechanical work. I should backtrack a little bit. At IBM, they um, they're really hiring a lot of people because they're trying to kind of expand the operation. Let me back up a little bit further and just ask. Uh, how did you decide to get into mechanical engineering as opposed to other engineering choices? You started thinking petroleum, obviously, from the folks you met at Aramco. 
You know, it's a good question. Uh, I, at uh, being smart, a small college with a small engineering department, the students studied whether you be mechanical, electrical, or civil. We studied the same classes, the same classes for the first year or two. Then after that, you specialize. And somehow, uh, I didn't think that civil, I, I wanted to do civil. I, maybe I was thinking about petroleum, working for an oil company, and in the nearest to that was mechanical uh, engineering. And that's maybe why I kind of focus on that. But again, it was very, you know, again, in a small college like that, you take the same classes everybody else takes, whether if you take a physics course, you take a physics class with the physics majors. Chemistry, likewise, with the chemistry majors. You take classes in economics with the economics majors. So like, sort of like very, very, um, they don't have special classes for engineers. It's just you're gonna be with everybody else. The same thing, same thing in the engineering school. They, um, many of the classes, doesn't matter what your discipline is, you take the same class until you specialize. Uh, so I interrupted you, you were talking about I, about how IBM hired engineers yes. in Poughkeepsie in that time period. That's where I backed you up, so. Yeah, yeah, they, they I think not only IBM, because people use, companies used to come to campus to interview students who are graduating, and they're, they're I don't know what it is back, I'm talking now about 1956. And somehow, any graduate had multiple offers to choose from. Maybe things stayed that way for a long time, maybe it still is that way, but at least it was that way at the time. So I had offers from different companies as well. I know Westinghouse offered a job, a couple of other ones too. We apply, you know, people, they offer a job. Now, the, the way I decided on IBM, I kind of liked uh, the computer business. I tried to get a job in the oil field, but that wasn't really quite fit what I was looking for, so I didn't, I didn't do it. Uh, so I took the job at IBM, and then we, we moved to Poughkeepsie. And one of the first the assignments I had was low voltage contacts. If you remember, that was the time when transistorized computers were becoming popular. Up until that were tubes, then you know, transistors. And transistors have very low power. And uh, the lot of contacts you have on boards and in those machines, and if the contacts fail, you don't make a good contact, you have a short. You have, I mean, you have a, an opening, and the circuit doesn't work. So very often, if you remember, probably we all did that, at home, for the TV or for the radio, you, you bang it. So that if it stops working, you bang it, it will start to go again. That's what you're doing is you're making that contacts, make better contact. So that was my job. How to, what do we have to do? And you know, it was, I did a lot of research, as a matter of fact, I was taking classes at night towards a master's degree, and that was my dissertation of what I was doing the job, I became my dissertation for the master's degree. <laughs> you know, it was through Syracuse University, which I, I graduated in, in, with master's degree in 1960 by taking classes at night. But anyway, uh, when you look back at all the things that require nice contacts, uh, it, it was very, Fascinating field, uh, and very important to the company at the time. Then from that, being a mechanical engineer, and I, I guess my management liked what I did, so they offered me a, a nice job after that I've done that work in the tape business. Now, this would be about 1954, no, no, more like in 1958. 58, okay. 58. Uh, and uh, the project we had going at the time in the tape area was what they called a loop program. It never saw the day of light, but it's something we developed. We spent a lot of time doing where you store basically loops of 
mylar material with coat uh, with the with the recording surface on the outside where you can record on it and read back from it. And these things are about maybe um, six to eight inches in diameter. They're and they're about four inches wide. And the vacuum was used to pull these devices into their own pockets. So you have a machine with about, let's say, I think maybe it was 64 pockets where each one has one of these loops. And through vacuum, you suck them out into the read write sta station, and you spin them, and you read the information room, and you take them back. You know, we spent about, I think about a year and a half or, or more on this project. project. It was a beautiful machine. A lot of things moving around, and people love to see things move around. The only problem is that the recording surface was on the outside of this material, and it rubs against things on coming and going, and it, it's highly questionable if how reliable it can be. It was a question in the beginning of the program, and it also killed the program at the end because you couldn't really make it very reliable. Well, quick question on that. Was it a... Uh Head per track reader. Once you put the sausage on the on the spindle or the capstan, was it? Was there? No, no, no. It's it, like it, a each, drum. Each each, each uh, track was set, head has many tracks on it. No, you don't you don't slide it back and forth. You just it's you just put that against the head and the head. Like like a drum then. Like it's a drum. Yeah, a drum exactly. with a replaceable surface. That's right. And were you there was a program in San Jose. The strip file, which actually came as a product, were you were you in competition with the strip file? No, I, no, I don't think so. I think the, the, this is um, San Jose was doing a lot, like with flexible media, as like like uh, flat pieces of media. That this one was really more of how to store it and access it. The idea was like a library. And that's really the, what was driving the whole concept, library concept. But it, it, did not, it didn't last too long. Mm -hmm. Before very long, we said, look, it's not going to happen, so it was killed. And uh, the engineers who work on that moved on to, quote-unquote, hypertape development. And, um, you know, that was an interesting program because IBM had finished, in that time frame, they've done the product, product called Tractor. It's a massive amount of information being stored on two inch wide tape and automated system, very, very expensive, very limited in, in applications. But the idea was trying to take that to the commercial market area. And that's where the hyper tape concept came about. You go from two inches wide to like one inch wide tape and you go into a system with vacuum columns. Now keep in mind, up until that time, or pro starting early er in the early 50s, there was a tape product at IBM, I guess it was number like 727, became 729, different models of them. Those were all tape drives that used like pinch roller to move the tape. Uh, they, they're very successful but very low density, very low capacity, uh, and they were, that's what they had, that's what IBM had, that's what IBM was selling. Somehow in that time frame, there's competition to IBM from other tape manufacturers, and people who are showing that they have some technologies that may be better than what IBM has. So the, the hyper tape that we were trying to develop was to basically show that IBM has what the market needs, very reliable, high capacity, high performance device. The only thing is that it's a different media than what they had before. Up until that time, their reels of tape, half inch right tape, which was used on the 727-729 product, and now you're gonna to go to a different media, wider tape, and the market did not want to change. They wanted to have, want to be able to exchange tape from one machine to the next. And that's what they were able to do before with the 729, 727 products. 
Uh, and so it, it wasn't a sex, very successful opera. Even though it performed well, it wasn't very successful. And we, I mean, we started to see people trying to compete in that market area. And as a matter of fact, there are several manufacturers, Ampex, Potter, Telex, and others, came up with tape drives like what IBM has that can read the IBM nine half-inch tapes. And that became very worrisome for the IBM people. Now, I was involved in the tape pad design of the hypertape, how to read and write, uh, record on that surface correctly and properly. Now, not, I wasn't involved in the recording technology, I was involved in how you move the tape and how you you get you get the motion, very reliable motion, fast start stop, and so on. When it became clear that that product is not going to be a booming success, I remember one time, a time that I was called in by my manager, Ray Barbo, to go with him to see the lab manager. We go to see the lab manager. We sat down, he says, Jess, I want you to develop a product to compete with everything that people are doing out in the marketplace. A half-inch product. I say, what kind of spec? He says, I want it to be better than anybody else's. That's the spec. Make it better than anything anybody else has that we're going to build. And you're going to develop that. You're going to be the, the, the product manager for it. So, you know all the engineers here? You select the engineers you like to have with you and go out and do it. So I was giving that responsibility, very delighted, obviously. Uh, and uh, so that, I'm talking here about uh, around 64, 65 time frame. Yeah. And uh, so, before we get into the, I guess it becomes a 20, the, uh, this now becomes a 2400, isn't it? Is it pardon, pardon me? Doesn't this product become the 2400? That's correct. Okay, so, <coughs> so let's talk a little bit more about Hypertape. Yes. And uh, perhaps about some of the other people in the labs at that time. Uh, you worked on the, the... Mechanism. The mechanism. Correct. Were you involved with the capstan then? Capstan, yes. Who designed, whose idea was that capstan? Is it, well, the, ca the capstan was, was designed before that. Um, the, the tractor has two capstans, I believe, and the, the hypertape had one. Uh, I don't remember exactly who actually designed, designed that initially, but to make it work is what I was involved in. You know, you gotta test it, make sure that it can give you the, 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 the speed, start, stop speed you're looking for, the vacuum cons can respond the correct way. That, that's the area I was involved in. Um, I think the capstan concept of the capstan came from, uh, I tried to think. I don't remember exactly who did, yeah, who did that. Now you but, worked with uh, Jim Weidenheimer? Well, no, Jim Weidenheimer was the, the second level manager. And uh, he was more like overseeing the program, but he really went, and he was the, the guy who drove the tractor and made that happen. Uh, probably he was the one who specified and, and was behind doing the hypertape as a commercial, more commercial product as a spin-off from the tractor. Um, so he was making the big decisions, but as an engineer out of college, just being there for a few years, I really did not interact with him much. But then what we did interact with was the fellow who was working for him, Ray Barbo. He was the engineer in charge of making things happen. In IBM's term, he would be the product manager for the, for the hypertape? Yes, that was Ray Barbo. That's, That's correct. You became the product manager then for the next... The next Generate product. The half, the half inch product. That's correct. Okay. They had the half inch in 729, 727. They're all half inch, but of the half inch new design, 
was the Library we came to right. Project Manager program. Did uh, you encounter uh, Walt Buslick in that environment? You know, Walt worked there, but I don't, I, I don't remember exactly what his response to you was. I mean, the, the, I remember very well, uh, you know, when I think back about the people who are involved and I think about different individuals, um, well, many of the, the young and upcoming people became part of the 2420 program project that I was involved in. And uh, they all, we, we um, I don't want to be ahead of myself, but this project was started in Poughkeepsie. I'm talking about the, the, the building the best next tape drive in Poughkeepsie. And we staffed it in Poughkeepsie. Then, in, uh, 64, 65 time frame, IBM decided they're going to open a plant in Boulder, Colorado. Is going to be the tape business, manufacturing and engineering in Boulder. And so we were going to be moving sometime within the next year from Poughkeepsie to Boulder. And it was our job to make sure it is my job that, that I have the staff to come here with me, the ones who were involved in the development, because the pro product was under development. And we need to have people stay with it. And so we found out that some people did not want to move. That others who were in other locations, San Jose or here or there, wanted to come to Boulder. So we had to make some swaps. Somebody who doesn't want to come, replace somebody who can come. So we've, we've gone through all that. And in 1965 and early 66, 66 the operation was moved to, to Boulder. And uh, now I should explain a little bit, being a project manager, my responsibility was to have that product get to the market and meet all the specs and the requirements IBM have. And I mean, it had a lot of demands. It's a product test. The product has to pass product test. It has to pass some, what they used to call at the time, availability, reliability, and serviceability requirements. Uh, these are things that are there to make sure when the product is shipped to the customer, it's going to perform well, it's going to be serviced well, it's going to be a profitable project. And the recording part of the business was done under a different department. The control unit under a different department. But my job was to integrate those into the drive and controlling the, 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 the offering to the marketplace. So even though I did not, I wasn't responsible for the control unit, I was responsible for the integration of it as part of the subsystem. It became a subsystem to be offered. Now, I'm talking about in 1966, we were here in Boulder developing the product. We announced the product in 1998. 68? I'm sorry, sorry. 68, I meant. 68. And um, start shipping it in 1968. Now, that, that, those 66, 67, 68, those years we spent a lot of time making sure we have a product that meets the criteria which was the best product on the market. So we, have, we made sure that it's reliable, made sure it has the, the, the specifications, the data rate, the speed, um, the, the storage capacity was established for us, but the, 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 the specs of it are to be met. Uh, and uh, I would say we, compare, we looked at what's available, because by that time, several manufacturers, as I said earlier, were selling products in the marketplace plug compatible with the IBM equipment. So IBM specific, uh, the being plug compatible means that you can unplug an IBM, 
machine and plug in somebody else's machine into the same uh, connection, and you can run that machine because you have you meet the, all the spec requirements. Uh, we have evaluated all these many different machines, and we want to make sure that what we have is better than what anybody else has. And I, we felt pretty good about that. You actually bought their machines, brought them into the lab, and tested them. You actually purchased the competitive you machines. You know, it's really funny. We we have done, we done a little bit of that, but we have actually. We did not buy all the machines, maybe we bought some, but others we went to shows, we talked to customers who have them, to see what, what they find good about them, what bad about them, and we use that knowledge trying to make sure that what we have is better than that. But you know, when you develop a machine, any kind of a product, you also know that where the weaknesses are. I mean, even though we developed what we thought was a great product, but we still, we knew there's certain things we could do better. And uh, we do that, but we didn't have to do anything about it. Now, we had a, a strong theme together in Boulder, and the product is being shipped, being manufactured in Boulder and being shipped. And about a year later, the beginning of 1969, or maybe late 68, IBM did a forecast of that product. Now, I should backtrack. The forecast that we were working with, that we had to justify the product and its profitability, was based on being able to ship 5,000 units to the marketplace. That was what I was working with. We, th we, th we, th I mean, well, we think we can ship 5,000 of these machines to the marketplace. It was, they're priced at 82,000 a piece. That's like a $4 billion business for IBM was pretty lucrative. When they did, did a forecast after several months of shipping this product, a forecast was made that the market can use not 5,000, but 45,000. I said, wow, I heard that, you know, when I saw that information coming in from, with that forecast, I said, this is really something. I remember going home one day after I read that forecast, and I told my wife, you know, I'm going to start writing a business plan. I can leave here and start a new company, even if I get 10% of that market. That'd be great business. I've always kind of wanted to do something on my own, but I, but I didn't want to do something, just nothing, or something really substantial. I thought, here's my chance to do something substantial. So I started to write a business plan. I'm talking about in the first quarter of, of 1969. And obviously, I needed the support of some of the key guys I had working with me at IBM. I know the first guy I approached was Juan Rodriguez. Juan was a little bit antsy to do something different. He actually accepted a job with the Duffer Company, then he was knocked out of it. He was kind of ripe to do something different. He said, Juan, I want to do such and such. You want to join me? He said, absolutely. Now, the business plan I was writing became a little more uh, detailed, because I knew the market. I was living that product, living that market. I know what was going on in the marketplace. But one thing that I wanted to make sure that we do right is that IBM is very strong in the marketplace. They have very strong sales and service organization. If we're going to build a product to, be, to, to compete with IBM, we want to make sure that we can sell it to the user, user marketplace. Because many people say, okay, I can sell this to the OEM market, to Univac or somebody else. But that's very, you cannot really count on that in building a business. You know, whether you can, what kind of volume they can do and so on, but end user, you can build it yourself. So from day one, I was very conscious of the fact that we need to not only build a product, but also build a sales and service organization as well. So, again, in the, 
April, May, June time frame, I got Zoll Herger to join in, Tom Cavanaugh to join in, and said, then I was really looking to get a, a sales executive from IBM. I talked to some, but I wasn't really excited about them. Still, we're working for IBM, doing this on the side with the idea that IBM is doing very well with their product. We can go out and get, take a piece of the market. Uh, Quick question. You gave me a copy of an early business plan dated yes. June of 69. That's the one. Is that the first one? Is that's that, the first one. That's the first one. Yes. That's great. The yeah. museum really appreciates that. Yeah. Let me Before we get into uh, the formation of Storage Technology Corp, I'd like to talk a little bit more about the uh, 2400 series. Now, you were a product manager. Yes. Now, as I understand the IBM terminology, there's a, there are different development managers responsible for the product. The product manager is the business manager. Am I was that your role as? No, no, no. I was, the, I was a project manager. Project manager. Not that product. Pro project manager. Yeah, I'm responsible for the whole product. Mm -hmm. yeah. But were the f folks developing the controller? Uh, let me explain that. The, the, there's product engineering. There's development engineering. That is when the product is developed by the development group. Then, in this manufacturing, there's a problem. That. The, the, the product engineers fix that problem and make sure the product, the manufacturer can build it and is, is going to the marketplace. They are, they don't do any, no innovations there, they're more like taking care of the product after it's been done. Uh, but what, uh, the job I had was the project itself mm -hmm. before it got into product engineering. Be, the development cycle of it mm -hmm. is where the project, the project but were the spot. development managers reporting directly to you? Or oh, yeah, right to me. Directly to you? Yes. Okay, so you were in the development organization. That's right. Okay. That's right. Do you recall the names of the uh, development managers doing the drive and the controller? Control unit? Who were they? Well, the drive, the drive was is divided into two pieces. One was in the mechanical part and one in the electrical part. Okay. The mechanical part was Zoll Herger. Electrical was Tom Cavanaugh. Oh. Then the recording area was, again, did not report to me, but was done through an organization, but the fellow doing the project, the management, or the, the manager of it was Juan Rodriguez. He okay. was, I don't know exactly what he has actually, was he, was he a manager or what, but he was, he, he did the development work. Mm -hmm. He was the brains behind the recording technology involved. Okay. Yeah. And how about the storage, the tape control unit? That was separate. Mm -hmm. But we you were just all involved with the drive. But again, my job being project manager is that I, our engineers connected our drive to that controller and tested it as a, subst as a subsystem. But we did not develop that. I was mm -hmm. never spoke with the developer of it. Mm -hmm. Do you know who was head of development of the, of the tape control unit? Doesn't matter, but it'd be yeah. Nice. As a matter of fact, uh, one of the well, the fellow who was the controller development manager was um, Barry Cunningham. Barry Cunningham later on, when we finished developing the drive, we wanted to get into development of controls at Storage Tech. We hired him to come to Storage Tech to develop a controller for us. So he was, whether he, I'm just trying to think back, the control unit for the 2420 at IBM was an upgrade of the controllers that they had for the 729. I would say, yeah, Barry, Barry, Barry Cunningham was the one or one of the managers of controlling and development. Uh, we're throwing names in here, but I, I, I would say with him, when we hired him to come over to storage to Boulder, one of the people who came with him was like Eric Rinjob, Andy Anderson. Yeah, he brought a team of guys who can build the control unit from scratch for us. One other thing, I, I believe, 
and correct me if I'm wrong, uh, the 2400 series introduced the prolay as the uh, mechanism for moving the tape. Uh, repeat that again, please. The prolay as a device that controlled the motion of the tape. Um, and it's basically uh, a device. Well, the reason I mention it is Bill Phillips, when I was talking to him in Tucson, he thought that was the best invention he'd ever seen in his, his entire 50 year experience with tape. You know, so <coughs> I'm sort of curious then as to. I think he's talking about the driver, the capstan, the what drives right. the capstan. Yeah, yeah. Um. It's. It, it, uh, it, it did stick in my mind the way it stuck in Bill Phillips' mind <laughs> as being something really, I mean, it was part of the capsule mechanism. Yes. Uh, and how you can actually move, move the capsule at very high speed. And uh, keep in mind, we're talking about here a device which moved tape, start to stop the tape. Uh, later on, people got away from starting and stopping by just moving continuously and storage the data. At that time, we were moving and stopping to get to the data. And so, yeah, the mechanism was quite involved, and it, it had to, to perform that. There's actually several articles about it posted on the web, and I, so I looked at them, and it, it was an ingenious mechanism, but basically, it, it, without ever contacting the recording surface, it still allowed the tape to be stopped and, and accelerated in either direction at very high rates, and I, I think it was introduced in that 2400 series of Yeah, it was a, it's a, it's a capsule, capsule drive mechanism. I mean, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Which was, was different than, than, say, was used in the uh, tractor or in the hypertape. That's correct. And different than was used in the 700s, said in the 7 2, 2X series, which were pinch rollers. Right? That's right. Pinch rollers cause problems with life of the tape. So the, Ultimately, yes, we, we stopped, stopped, yeah. and starting, yeah. and that was uh, perhaps... Well, the, the, the team I had designed that. As okay. a matter of fact, if you had a chat, well, let's see, let me think here. Yeah. Dwight Johnson was one of the guys involved in the project. <clears throat> Zoll Herger was the manager of it. Uh, you know, the, 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 the guys who, who designed this thing, yeah. So yeah. we're going to have lunch with Saul on That's Thursday. Right. Uh, Thursday. Maybe yes. I'll ask him. Ask him. Ask him. We'll see yeah. Yeah. He, actually, um, Saul is quite a guy. Saul came in front of You got to understand that this, this group of people who, the four of us who started Storage Tech, you know, I was driving it, but the people I brought in with me, Saul from Hungary, Juan from uh, Cuba, then Tom Cavanaugh is born here. <laughs> it's a lot of foreign guys in here. Uh, and, um, but Zoll is an excellent manager. Says, Zoll, we need to get this one, this job done in a certain way by such and such a time. It's done. We don't have to repeat it. He gets it done. Uh, he just, in his mind, he was able to control things to make things happen and deliver on schedules. You don't have, very often you, you, you talk to somebody about something, you think, well, you have to repeat it again to make sure it's gonna happen, and that was all. You'll have to do that with him. <laughs> yeah. So we've been going about an hour now. Would, this, would you like to take a break? No, I'm fine. You're fine. Well, I'll drink some water, but okay. how are we doing time-wise? Are we moving okay? Mm -hmm. I think we're on track to finish by four, which was your requirement, the request. Although I do have Friday morning available if we go over. Um, if you're willing to continue, uh, I'm willing to continue. Maybe we'll take, we'll try again. Um, yeah. Okay, so we're now in the, the spring of 69. You've written a business plan. Yep. Um, and identified a few people, talked to them, and they're ready to join. So in the business June 69 business plan I've looked at, uh, actually you and Saul, Zal and uh, Juan are identified, uh, but you're still at IBM. Oh yeah, yeah, I still work at IBM. But that's the plan I was putting together. I should, uh, I'm trying to 
get to uh, putting a plan together to raise some money to do get some financing, and that was the plan I put together. Great detail about the product. I knew the product. I knew the market. I knew what we wanted to be able to, to the people I would need to bring into the company uh, to do the job, and that business plan was designed with the idea that. We like to raise some money initially to get started. Then a few months later, we'll raise more money as we get the team together, so we we'll become more. It's real rather than fiction in the minds of investors. Uh, and uh, then somehow we'll be able to raise more money from different sources. So obviously we knew the needs we're looking for, we were looking like for in total about $2 million. But again, you talk about 1969. 69, venture capital was not that popular, was not, um, people were not doing it. Uh, not too many people in the venture business, venture investing in venture deals. But J.H. Whitney Company in New York City have invested in a company called Inferex in the Boston area. And it just happened that one of my friends went to work for Inforex, and he knew the guy from J.H. Whitney who made that investment. So it was my contact to somebody in the venture business. The guy's name was Dave Dunn. So with the business plan that I put together, uh, I said, you know, I would like to talk to this guy. So I called him up, and I'm talking here about the June I think it was in June, 1969. Called him up, and I was told he's not here, he's traveling, but his assistant uh, took the call. He said, hey, send us a business plan, we'll look at it. It just did, did not excite me too much. And lo and behold, three days later, I got a call from Dave Dunn, his boss, saying to me, I understand you talked to um, Myers, is the name of his assistant, and uh, you guys have an idea for a company in the storage area. He said, I'm really interested. I'd like to come and see you. He didn't even ask for a visit. You want to come and see me? So we set the time for him to come out. It just happened that he was in Florida sailing a boat up to New York and he stopped halfway up somewhere in the way. He called his office, told me, and I called him, so he, he got really excited, so he called me. Now, I should backtrack a little bit. About a year before that, a company in San Jose was established uh, to build a disk drive by, I guess what, known by uh, 12 people who got together to build a disk drive. Call them the dirty dozen, I guess. And somehow, Dave Dunn heard about that. Maybe he felt bad about that being participating in that deal. When he heard from me, he, he wants to come and talk. So he came over to Boulder with his Mike Myers, his assistant. We had, I had Zol and Tom and Juan with me. He met, he met him. Afterwards, he and I sat down to talk, the deal. I told him I was looking for a quarter million dollars. And they agreed, he, he said, we'll do it. And I believe they got 40% of the company for 40, quarter million bucks. I guess we're talking about 1969, you know? As a matter of fact, the way it turned out is that the company well, anyway, when then he said, I should go to New York and meet uh, Ben Schmidt, the, 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 the top guy at J.H. Whitney and Company, to get their commitment to the deal, which I did. Once they approved it, I came back. This is now, I'm talking about the end of July. Came back. I said, it's time to, to move forward. To, to quit IBM and start a business. Now, I should also add that uh, 
to make sure that our interest in that company, you know, when you have, when you have an investor and they buy stock this at a dollar per share, we as insiders buy the stock at a penny per share. They want to make sure there's timing between the two because their money comes in after we put our money in, uh, which we agreed, fine. They, they, even though we're talking about the beginning of August, they said, let's delay, they're putting the money in for a couple of months. And, and this is something that uh, I put my own money in to run the company for the per first couple of months until they put their money in. But I didn't necessarily tell this to the employees because it, they may get a bit nervous. To, are they going to do it? Are they going to do it? Because I was, I had no question that this was going to happen. So uh, we, I went to tell my managers, I'm quitting. The guys who were working for me, Zoll Herger, Tom Cavanaugh, they quit, tell me that they quit. So I told my manager, I'm going to quit. These two guys are also quitting. So I began to get a little bit excited about, gosh, they want to talk me out of it. And uh, they want me to meet with uh, top brass and this and that, everything else. I said, you know, you guys got to have respect for somebody. I mean, I've made up my mind. I want to do this. I think it's good. We're not, we're very straightforward about how we're going to do it. We're not going to try to do anything um, improper. And you should accept that. And I'll tell you something, they did. They accepted that. They just laid off trying to kind of talk me out of it. I said, good luck to you. Hmm. And uh, my message to all the employees coming in to join us after that was, I don't want any information coming from IBM with you. We want your brains, that's all we want. If you feel that you have to take some materials, some documents, some, don't even think about it, because we don't want to do that, because that is not healthy for this business. We'll give IBM a chance to come back and maybe sue us for something, and we could kill the company altogether. So we don't want any of that. So we selected some tal talented people to, to, I mean, I should say, after we quit, we're out of IBM, Almost every engineer in the department called up and like to get a job. And that's just what I'm talking about. So we added a handful of people. So the engineering team was put to, within about two weeks, we had the engineering team all staffed, people who came in from IBM. But going back, I felt it's very important to really build a company to have two other talented people added to the topic six. One is guy heading sales and marketing, and one heading finance. And so, uh, this is kind of a nice story. Uh, <clears throat> I said, who would the best market sales guy to be that we can bring in? So a guy who's selling some competitive tape drives in the marketplace and succeeding at it to some degree. So I kind of felt that Telex had a guy named Jim McGuire. Mm -hmm. So I put an ad in Tulsa, Oklahoma, where Jim McGuire was, say we're looking for a guy to head this operation. And somebody signed there, told Jim about Jim called me up and we ended up meeting and said, Jim, I always want you to be the guy who can sell that crap to the marketplace and make it stick. If you can sell that, I have we can have a fantastic product, you can really do well. So anyway, it, it was, we added Jim at that stage of the game, I'm talking about within a few months after we come, come together, we had no product, but I wanted to have a sales guy who can build a sales and service organization. I, I keep saying that because he insisted service should really also report to him as well. Then at the same time also hired a, a VP of finance to make sure that we're keeping track of the finance of the business. So by year end, 2069, we had all the elements that you need to really build a strong business. The engineering team, marketing, the controls there with the financial people in place. And uh, about 14 months after we started, we actually showed a product at the computer show. It wasn't ready to ship to customers, but something that you could show, it operates, it just performed, we have specs written, Actually, it was in Atlantic City. We had a computer out there, we showed it to people, and of course, 
Jim McGuire wants to invite some of the people he's known in the marketplace who are ready to buy a new product if it can do the stuff we're talking about. So basically, we uh, were able to get people signed up to buy the product when we have it available at that 14 months after we got started. Uh, <clears throat> now, just to back up a little bit, um, were you aware uh, in IBM San Jose, Shugart left IBM San Jose in the same time period, I think in April of 69. Yeah. He went, and the San Jose reaction, as I understand, was not as benign as the Boulder management reaction. Any idea? Well, the Boulder reaction was really very strong. They worked very hard trying to kind of convince me not, not, not to leave. Mm -hmm. They had uh, one of their top VPs come over to Boulder and meet with me. Uh, and uh, I think, I don't know exactly what uh, Al Sugar's reaction was, but my point was very straightforward, is that I'm leaving. I mean, uh, this is wrong that you're trying to kind of convince me to otherwise when I already had made up my mind. You should have respect for me. And I think they backed off. Maybe the same thing happened there, possibly. You know, Al is a more, more brash than I am, I think, possibly. Maybe he pissed him off. Well, there are things about Al, but I mean, his mantra, so I was at Memorex as an engineering manager at the time. Yeah. And his mantra was very much the same as yours. I want your mind, I don't want any piece of paper, don't, don't even think about bringing yeah, it. Yeah, exactly. Bring, bring, you know, it's, I'm hiring you for your mind. Ultimately, there was a very nasty trade secret lawsuit between IBM sued Memorex within a year or so. I don't think they ever sued Storage tech on the same way. No, they never did. Yeah. As a matter of fact, that, that's what I meant by benign. I mean, ultimately, it got very nasty in San Jose. Well, I made a big. Well, I don't. Again, I I can say this about the relationship we have with IBM. The after we left IBM, and after a bunch of the engineers joined us, and made it clear that whoever comes to us is going to come clean, not to have anything in there that looks like they have taken trade secrets with them. And um, we developed and we, our product. We filed for several patents. And maybe about a year or two later, we had discussions with IBM about patents. IBM came to us and said, look, we, they think that maybe we're infringing on some of their patents. And they said, well, we like some of the patents you guys have too. Let's have a little discussion. We had a discussion about uh, patents, and they, they felt, and I, I vaguely remember this, but they said, you know, you really got to pay us some money. We're not talking about too much, but pay us some money. So what are you talking about? So we'll give you a cross license to use the patents you have. And, and I think you have give us a cross license for a lot of patents. And we want to use your patents, but you got to pay us a little bit of money. So how much money? 20,000 bucks over a year or so. So we said, okay, we paid them our money. And we had um, signed a cross license with them. I should add a little anecdote about that. The fellow who did the negotiations for IBM came in with a beautiful briefcase. I said, well, that's a really beautiful briefcase. Yeah. When we signed the document at another session and signed all the cross licenses, it came in in that a briefcase just like that one. After we sign it, he gives me the briefcase with the paper in it. <laughs> I thought it was kind of a nice gesture on his part. That is yeah. a very classy gesture. Yeah, yeah, I would say so. I would say so. <clears throat> the, uh, and you know, all, uh, with time, we've talked to IBM about products. Uh, and uh, I think we tried to keep, we, we kept the relationship with IBM clean as we went forward. We tried to sell IBM our super disk that they, they won't buy. I, I talked actually to the president of IBM at the time. He said to me, Jess, he said, you know, our people think this is a really great innovation that you guys have, but there's an NIH factor, they're not going to buy it from you. <laughs> it's, 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 don't waste your time. So, <laughs> um, it, it just may be that uh, your relationship with the management, senior management at Boulder, was better than the relationship that Shugart had 
with San Jose, and that was not good. Yeah. It, it was, in fact, Stugart had been transferred out of San Jose and was sent to the East Coast to run a educational division in, in Connecticut, which precipitated, because he was not going to leave California, yeah. that sort of precipitated yeah. his leaving. So there was, there was bad blood that apparently didn't exist at, uh, at Boulder with, with uh, your folks. Yeah, I'm just thinking back about what could IBM have done. Uh, they could have sued us, but we tried not to get, we tried everything possible so they have no grounds for a suit. Secondly, I think later on it came about that maybe it's good for IBM to have a legitimate competitor out there. They didn't like, I mean, I heard that later on. Maybe it's not too bad to have somebody decent out there competing with them in that tape business. Um, but, you know, again, whatever reasons are, I think I was very concerned that we may get sued from IBM. Uh, and if they did sue us, we don't have the whereabouts to, to win. It would take time and money and resources that you really can't afford. And so we did everything possible to, not to allow that to happen. So, all I can say. One other point that uh, may be coincidence, I think Benno Schmidt, Yeah. I think he was involved in Memorex. I, I believe he may have even been on its board at one point, which is another interesting aspect of your financing. He was very familiar with, uh, now here I could be wrong and I'll correct the record it's, if I it's possible. It's possible, I don't, I don't remember. I remember the name is so distinctive. How many yeah. Benno Schmitz do you know? In, well, that's in right, that's too many of them, that's correct, that's correct. Yeah. And I'm yeah. pretty sure, I, I'm certain he was involved with Memorex, now whether the financing or not. Yeah, he could have been. I, <clears throat> the partner in that firm who was, that I went to see was Dave Dunn, afterwards became, um, after Dave Dunn left that firm to do something on his own, was um, Dick Stedman became the partner involved. That he was on our board and he stayed on our board for like forever. Um, yeah, I did find the uh, prospectus when he went public, yep. which has a lot of that information. Oh in yeah, there. yeah, you see the names there, yeah, yeah. yeah. Sure. Uh, Tom Horgan was on the board in the early days. He was the president of Infrax, the company that I mentioned earlier that Dave Dunn was on the board of. <clears throat> so now you're second half of 69. You're, you're funding the company out of your pocket. Uh, the first couple of months. First couple of months. And then after that, the money came in from J.H. Whitney. Mm -hmm. And again. That's not a lot of money. No, 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 no. no. With the idea that we, the whole concept was once we, uh, we are, the beginning was a, 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 a plan. And at least what we heard is that people with money, they wanted to see more than a plan before they fund the business. So the thought was for the, the plan was good to be able to raise a quarter million bucks. But once we've done that, a few months after that, we need more. And with about, I would say about four or five months later, we were in contact with other people, we raised 600,000. And now I should add, mention that raising money for Story Strike was one of the major and most involved thing that we've had throughout the history of the company. Initial funding, quarter million dollars, 600,000, followed by I've tried to think exactly when the first IPO came. We raised like $3 million in an IPO. I think like the middle of 2071. Before that, we have arranged for a, uh, uh, in that same time area, we arranged for a bank line with Citibank for $4 million. We raised money through private entities three times, initial funding, second funding, third funding. That would, took us to the point we were able to, to arrange a bank line 
And then after that, we had a, an, uh, raise money IP, in an IPO. A year later, we have a secondary, more money raised publicly. But when we start shipping products, we needed, and I should go back, we're, now we're focusing on the end user marketplace. We've had, right from the beginning, as I mentioned earlier, hired Jim McGuire as heading sales and marketing to sell the product to users. And users who were buying products from IBM were leasing rather than buying. So we're in a leasing business. And the leases were two-year leases. They would sign, IBM signs two-year leases, we have to sign two-year leases. In a two-year lease, it's not enough money to, 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 to finance that, just plain financing. So you have to arrange special kind of financing. One of the, I read your business plan, and that's not reflected in your business plan. So that, that must have been an eye-opener to you at some point. Yeah, in a, in, in a business plan, we'll talking about building the product right. and having the right people there. And selling it. And at selling it. And selling it at That's right. When you deliver the product, you get the money. That's right. That's but, not the way the But as works. we got going, we said, hey, yeah, you can sell it, but you can get to your lease. And I get to your lease, that's not enough. Yeah, actually, some were on month to month lease, even then. Some were on two year and three year, but. Actually, around 1970, 71, IBM was strictly on a 30-day lease. 30 -day well, the, but we were able to sell two-year leases, but not more. A few cases we were able to get when we really wanted to have a full payout lease or something where we can finance. We wanted like more than two years, like we we're, were like three years. We got few customers to sign a, not really, not really three years. That's 36 months. They signed 28 month lease, which was the right amount to be able to fund it. But that's very few of those. The majority were two year leases. And um, we were able to find leasing companies who were willing to buy the product from us, pay us the full price of the sale price, and they collect the monthly revenue. And then once they receive their money, once they get all their money out of it, we share in the residual, which was, I think, very lucrative business for them, and it helped us quite a bit. So we had several of those deals uh, with, with leasing companies. I mean, as I mentioned, raising money became a very major thing for us, because we needed to finance. We were very successful in selling. The, the sales organization built up very rapidly. I think within about a year, by maybe the end of 2071, 72, to that time frame, we had about 100 people in the field, like 15 salespeople, the rest are all service people. I mean, there are a lot of people out there selling and service the product, and, and they're succeeding in, in selling. As a matter of fact, the type of salesman we, we hired is more than just a guy selling, more like, an, like a businessman. Those guys, have accounts that they really could work with very hard. They more like their accounts. They feel that it's important to make the customer happy, not only to sell them, but also make them happy. Uh, so they're, they're very effective. They're, they're very well paid too, because commission plan was very lucrative. They could sell, they could do well. So we, here we are now in, in 71, 72, selling tape products. And tape drives. Then we added a control unit in the 71 time frame. As I mentioned earlier, we said now we need to have a whole subsystem, drive plus a control unit. So we went back to the people developing the control units back in Poughkeepsie, and one of the managers there was Barry Cunningham. We hired Barry Cunningham to come out to Boulder to head the activity, and he brought with him a bunch of people. So I didn't realize that when tape moved to Boulder, tape control units remained in Poughkeepsie. That's what you just said. I'm trying to think back about that statement. Uh, eventually it came to Boulder too, but the team I'm talking about was still in Poughkeepsie. So, in Poughkeepsie. Okay. 
Why didn't those have Sepulveda before then? I cannot, I don't remember. But when we hired Barry and Eric and Anders and so on, they were still in Boulder. They actually, they were, because they came to Boulder to join us. Yeah. Yeah. The disk drive industry started the same way. The first, very first disk drives shipped on IBM control units to IBM customers. Yeah, yeah. 2841, 2311 class. But very quickly, the, the disk drive industry started producing its own storage control units. Yeah. ISS, Memorex, everybody from the 2314 class. Um, it sounds like it was later in the tape business. You, you went longer with, on I, was that the pricing the IBM control units was? Uh, well, no, we, we, we weren't out to build, you see there, there was a plug compatible activity going on there which you could only build a drive and be able to sell it. So that's how the business got started. But once we started to build the drives and sell them, we said the next product is to have mm -hmm. the control so we'd have a whole subsystem to sell. So did Telex sell No, drive? they were only selling, only drives. Telex was only None selling. of the competitors sold anything other than drives. Right. Okay. Yeah, none of them. Te Telex or... Right, so, so you, you were the first... First control unit for the drive. Uh, tape a company to move into the control unit. That's right, process. that's right, yeah, that's right, yeah. And you know, when you have your own control, or some system, you can add some more things uh, to give you better performance, to give more uh, transfer rates, higher transfer rates, and so on. Mm -hmm. So you know, you, you get more, you have now more to offer the, the user. Tell me uh, about your tape drive in comparison to the IBM drive you, as well, you know, we have to be, what you say, Buck and Palpy, it's the same data rate. Right. And using the same cartridge, you can read their cartridge. As a matter of fact, that's how we sold a lot of equipment in the beginning. A customer has IBM equipment installed, and for whatever reason, he could not read certain tapes. He written them, or written them in some machine, he beats them here to run them, he couldn't. We Interchangeability said, is hard. Yeah. We said to him, hey, we can read you. If you have tapes that don't, you can't read, we can read them for you. Really? He said, yeah. I said, yeah. What happened is that we had um, dynamic signal adjustment. Now, that, that, that's the stuff that Juan Rodriguez worked on, by the way. <laughs> we can control the signal. IBM, is, if the signal is below a certain level, that's it. You can't read it. We took it way down. If you can't read it, we start to play with the signal level to be able to read into the mud. And we could do that. We, we were able to do that. And so in many cases, we took some of those bad tapes and we read them. Huh. And the customers would say, hey, I'll give you the business. You know, so yeah. so <laughs> yeah. dynamic signal adjustment was yeah. one of your features. That's right. That's Other right. things, later on, I, when you had your control unit, you offered higher, higher uh, uh, speeds. Yeah, then we didn't have, yeah, that's right. Yeah, yeah. You, you double the capacity, the data rates. Uh, uh, you know, it's, uh, you get to more flexibility when you have a subsystem rather than just a, a drive. Mm -hmm. uh, and I would say the other competitors, other than IBM, I think they disappeared. When we hit the market, uh, Potter and Telex and those guys, whatever they were doing, just mm -hmm. they dried up. They could not compete with us. Which, was, yeah. so were, were there other things in your mechanism that you thought were superior to IBM that you could sell to the customer? You know, not, not, not a, you know, I, I don't remember something saying that this is so special that they don't have. But what we were able to sell is that better reliability. Because? Better performance because of the way we have designed the, 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 the tape path and the way we control the tape motion. I mean, th that's, that, that's part of the area that I worked on even though I was still managing the whole operation, but that was still the area, my, my expertise was in that area. Your heart was in that area. Yeah, 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 yeah. So it, it was- Your mind it was, was like, in finance, but your heart- Well, before very long I became, Salesman and financier as well, but you know that's where I spend more more time, more more of my time on. But that as as we went on. 
But you know, tape is kind of interesting. The tape subsystems we were offering to the market was really, we did a good job with it. It was very successful. It, and, and we had very reliable operation. And the thing about tape has long, long life. Um, And part of it is because of the compatibility. You want to be able to read old tapes on the device you have today because people have these wheels of tape, they have thousands of them stored, you want to be able to read them. So they tell you, look, you want to send me a machine where I can't read them? I don't want it. I want to be able to read all this stuff. And therefore, the life of tape drives in the marketplace is really long. Normally you say the machine would have a life of five years, six years, seven years. In tape, I think you're talking about at least 10, 15 years. People had them, they just skipped them. And sometimes some of the machines we sold to leasing companies, they recovered their investment, let's say in five years. Then we were in a residual area with them. Then we said, you know, we like to buy it back from them. So we, don't, we actually pay them to buy them back from the leasing companies, recondition them, and sold them again. I mean, and sh shipped, them to uh, shipped them to customers, and they sold them to uh, leasing company one more time. And they did have that life. They, they just, they, they did not um, get replaced by something better that soon. You know? As in the disk drive market where disk drives the, the, are, are constantly being that's right. turned into scrap metal because there's no substance, yeah, no, no have, yeah, use for them. That, that's true, that's true. Uh, uh, of course, tape took many, many, many years before they got into different format of tape and so on, but, but uh, the, the 2420 of IBM, the one we have at storage tech, they're, um, they stayed there for a long, long time. I'm sure there's still many. We're all over the place still now. You know, you, you, anytime you see a picture of a, some computer installation, you see tape drives there because there's something moving. You know, people like to see that. Yeah. Right, nine-track tape drives. Nine-track. As opposed to uh, the uh, more modern cartridge types. That's right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. The vacuum, Half entries of the, tape. The vacuum columns. The vacuum columns. That's correct. Yeah. Right. Yeah. That's, uh, yes, some people. I'm told think that's what a computer is because they've seen so many tape drives on. Oh yeah, I see a whole lot of them. No, that's and that's what you think that's a computer. No, that isn't the computer. Yeah. No, it's, uh, well, you know, it, it's it's a lot of these year after year uh, within the '70s we were um, selling. The growth of our sales activity was quite substantial. Like I think we, the first year we shipped product was like three million in sales went up to. I don't know. Uh, the year after that, like maybe about 10, 24, 64. These are millions of dollars worth of sales annually, mm -hmm. and and um, was very rapid growth with the business. And we kept thinking about, and again, um, we were started out as a tape company tape drives and then tape control units and tape subsystems. Then we said, hey, we have this sales and service organization. Why don't we just sell, sell disk as well? So we approached the folks from ISS, I guess it was the name of the company, who were making disk drives and selling. We had an OEM deal with them to buy their, their disk drive to sell to the same customers who were buying our tape drives. So we became a tape and disk supplier. A little bit later on, we developed our own disk drives, but that was the beginning of it. So, um, before we leave the subject of your challenges in financing, do you recall when it became, you know, how it became clear to you that uh, you really were in the business of raising raising money because of the uh, lease nature? Well, you know, that became very clear. Uh, when we went out, when we found out that the, the private money was very limited. Now we raised money from J.H. Whitney. We would back 
six months later, they plus some other executives, uh, True Taylor, you know, if the name is familiar to you or not, and um, uh, Rosenberg, I forget his, his name, but Rosenberg, some executives of a computer company in the, in the, in the um, LA area, <laughs> they invested in a company, and it's funny, I learned something from Rosenberg at the time. He said, you know, Mr. Aweda, or Jesse, whatever he said, he said, you know, there is, you can get money from any place you want to get it. But there's good money, there is better money. What you get from us is better money. Because we can also give you some advice that banks and others maybe don't, can't give you. But we can maybe help in that area. So there's good money, there's better money. So I get to thinking about better money, which is kind of interesting. So anyway, so we earned money from private individuals, individuals who were, who were uh, the only, actually we also had venture firms invest money in our company other than G.H. Whitney. But then you, there's a limit to that. Then that's you do, when you do the IPO. You always a little bit of IBL, but you don't want to go over diluting the equity of the company, at least the insider say that find a different way to raise money, right? To raise money privately, uh, uh, publicly. And then that's when you start to work with leasing companies. So before very long, you find yourself that at least my involvement was more than half my time was where are we going to raise the money from? You know? Now you were leasing. You were leasing the product to the yes. end user customer. You were getting money from private sources. But when you went to a leasing company, were you then selling them the equipment so they could lease it? No, 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 no. We leased it to a customer. You leased it to the customer, and then we sell the paper. We, the, the the customer sells the lease to a leasing company. So now they're holding the paper, the lease paper. And the lease money comes and goes into, into lockbox into their account from those customers. So they're collecting the lease revenue. They paid us, let's say for the time being, we leased the equipment on a two-year lease to a customer. And he's going to pay us, let's say, 1000 bucks a month. In two years, it's $24,000. Maybe that's, that's for a bunch of equipment. Leasing company says, OK, we're going to pay you. He's going to pay so much a month. We'll pay you, let's say, thirty-five thousand now, and when the lease money comes in, it goes right to us. But it, it comes to you. It's it, an STC it goes in lock, lease. Yes, and then the money flows through to the leasing company. That's correct. We, the money comes to us, and we transfer that to them. Now, once they received the two-year lease, and then the, in most cases, the customer will renew it. So there's more money coming in. It goes to the leasing company. They recovered, they say, their thirty-five thousand plus, plus a profit on top of that, and so we said, say, okay, at that time we start to split the money coming in. They get to say fifty percent. We get fifty percent of the balance after that. But um, so that's one way of, mm -hmm. like the machine, like we're selling the machine basically to the leasing company. And that's how we get our money. Uh, and actually, we ran that way for quite a while. Mm -hmm. But again, we, we, we kept thinking that, hey, we can now sell not only tape, we can sell disc. Sure. Then we developed a, an add-on memory product as well, which is you know, very popular. We, we work with Intel on that until they have their own device before very long. Uh, was really was really a successful product. The people wanted to have high high speed, like cash, uh, mm -hmm. for the data. You have, have disk. You have, now you have they have uh, much higher data rate transfer rate when you have uh, hard disk drive. Uh, then we also added a uh, a printer. Now here it is. Somehow, every time I think back about that, I think maybe that was a smart thing, but we, we actually bought a company in Florida in the printer business. So again, we sell the same printer to the same people who buy the tape and the disc from us, they buy printers. Sure. So, now, was this a deliberate strategy that you sat down at some point and said, well, 
we're going to add these equipment, or is this ad hoc? No, no. The, the, the whole idea was we like to add all. We have we felt we have a very strong sales and service organization. We like to keep feeding them product that they could keep. Sell. They have the ability to sell. They sell, and that's where the idea of this having a computer, a medium-sized CPU, added to what we're doing, and then we'll be able to offer complete systems to customers. Did you look at your customer base? At, at one, I, I have a quote from you here sometime around in the mid-70s where you're saying we're not going to do a computer for at least the next two years. Uh, well, we didn't do the computer up until it was 81 or thereabouts in the 80s. So, I mean, was this a... Early on, your strategy was to ultimately get to the computer business or as you... As you provided more things for your f sales folks to sell, you realize that, well, the ultimate place we got to go is... I think that's what happened. It wasn't like from day one, no. It, wasn't. It, oh. it developed with time. Now we, have the, now we have the multiple products. We have a lot of customers out there. We can now sell a complete system. Mm -hmm. Now, <clears throat> thinking back, it was a lot because when you get into the complete complete system, I should. I'd like to talk over some of the uh, earlier products, yeah. particularly disc products, given my background. Yeah. Uh, before we before we get into the right, 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 yeah, okay, yeah. I I don't, I don't want to get into the CPU now, but I'll, but um, let's talk about disc drives. Let's talk about so this. So we, we, we acquired, we were buying on OEM basis disk drives from ISS. Any interesting experiences in the... Not really. I mean, I think we liked, we liked that, the product that they had. One thing really amazed me is that they were not very successful. You know, for some reason, they had a great product, but they did not do much with it. They were not able to expand the market significantly with what they have on their own. Well, they faced the same business as all the problem that all business, uh, plug compatible business har hardware manufacturers faced. It's the sales and service costs, the least nature yeah. of the business. Right. They chose to go the OEM route. Right. They chose to, if ITEL was their big. Uh, marketing channel, they sold most of their product, they tried to sell OEM, but, but their volume was to ITEL, and when you're in, in that relationship of a s one customer, one seller, that, that's not too you, you're really at the mercy of ITEL, they were at the mercy of ITEL. We absolutely are, absolutely are. So they, they had a great product, good team. Oh yeah, it was, it was. But, uh, but after, after we I don't know why we said we could, we could not see ourselves doing a lot more with them. We decided that we would do the next product ourselves. And the next product was a... Uh, um, you, you invested in and then acquired Superdisc? No, we actually, we, we actually developed it ourselves. Superdisc? Yeah. It's four spindles. Yep. Yeah. No, I... We ha have mutual friends at that company. Uh, I know I, Terry Johnson, of course. Sure, yeah. Work. Roy Applequist, uh, Al Wilson. There are a bunch of folks. Went, yeah, yeah. Uh, they all worked with me at Memorex. It was a great product. I mean, very massive amount of product. And, you know, we had, we had some success with it, but it was really tough, tough to sell, too. I mean, it's sort of like, it's a major piece of hardware. Very... It, we decided while we're doing that, even though we sold some, but I wouldn't say it was a booming success. It was, was fine, but... So we said we really need to do a regular disk drive, which we developed, I guess, the 8380 or something like that. Uh, and was, we thought, very competitive product in the marketplace. And I, 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 I can think back about that. Now, now we're talking about the late 70s now. Now you move the folks, the storage disk, super disk corp folks, were in California, I believe. You moved them to Boulder, or did they come right out to Boulder from the beginning? They were in Boulder from the beginning. From the beginning. Yeah. 
clear in that they were they were in California when they all worked for Memorex. So yeah. somehow they made the transition. Yeah, we did not develop discs in California. We developed CPU in California, but not discs. Disc was done in in, in Boulder. Boulder okay. In Boulder. Uh, then we got into the. Even though we're still selling the super disc, but you know, again, we thought we need something more like a little bit like the tape products, more bigger volume that people are used to and accept. Which was, I believe, number like 8380 uh, product. I, I remember like something about that. <clears throat> we were trying to find some major customers to buy the product initially to get get to get it. Um, accepted and give it some leverage in the marketplace. So one of the customers we were working with was, um, I think it was Chase Manhattan Bank. They were gonna be one of the early customers of taking the product from us. The senior VP in charge of their data processing wanted to talk to me. So I go to New York with the salesman and the sales manager to see him. We go to his office. He says to me, just come to my office. He told the other two guys, you stay here. He says, want to talk to me alone. So I go in there to talk to him. He says to me, just even though we committed to buying 36 of these boxes from you right now, uh, and you gave us the right price, we're happy with it, but I'm not going to give you the order. He said, I'm in the midst of trying to get upgrades being done by IBM for me. And if I buy your disk and still buy it from IBM, they're going to slow that activity and I can't afford it. But I owe you one. That's the point, right? He said, but I owe you one. He said, thank you. He left kind of disappointed, but he owes me one. Now, within 24 months, we had four times the size of that order placed with him. When he said, I owe you one, he actually, after he got his software taken care of, he was happy. All the orders after that came to us. Hmm. So uh, business people are people you can, people sometimes wonder you can't trust them, you can really trust them. They say something, they do it. We were in the 80, 81, we were start, we start to ship that product, and IBM filled back with their equivalent product. They, they failed to ship it on schedule. They were by a year behind schedule. I remember in 81, our sales guys say, wow, this is <clears throat> a chance we have to really hit this market very hard and really do well. Because IBM cannot do it, we can do it. I think that was the 8650. 8650, you're probably right. The, 80, that's the yeah. double density 3350 that's class right. product. That's correct. 635 megabytes per spindle. That was a huge product for. It was. It was tech. huge. Absolutely. It was. And we thought we have an opportunity here to really hit the market hard with that. Again, again the reason was IBM could not deliver, we were delivering, we thought we could really go there big. I, actually, it's, I, it was one of the few times IBM did not do a double density version of their product. Historically, yeah. IBM produced one or two or sometimes three generations of hard disk drives, from, right. but the 3350, was, they never did a double density. Storage Tech did one, most everybody did one. IBM tried to go to the 3380, and but, it was delayed. By the time frame I'm talking about, IBM did fall behind in, 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 in shipping products. Yep. I'm not, maybe I'm not, <clears throat> no, you, don't remember that, but they did. You, no, you've got and, exactly And we right. were attacked the market hard, and maybe that was, caused us a problem. That caused us a problem in the fact that we have our product did not perform as well as it should have. And we had a little setback in that one. 
And I think that was the first time this company, which was growing rapidly, like 40% annually in, in revenues and growth, we lost money. Now, <clears throat> that was very uh, disheartening, but we thought we could pull out of that. But then we found ourselves in the same bind at that same time, uh, where we're, we're behind schedule in our CPU development. Even though we raised a lot of money to get that project going and moving forward, it was costing too much money and we were behind schedule. And now money became a little bit tight. Up until that time, we were managing things by different ways of funding. The IPO done, leasing companies, then, have, then we had uh, what you may call a uh, uh, private placement to fight for specific pro projects. We have a private placement to do the CPU. We have a private placement to do the uh, optical disk drive. And those placements where we raised money for that project, but it wasn't really enough to do the project, complete the project. We had to pump all money in ourselves. So we found ourselves in a, in a bind in, in the 2000, um, and, no, not 2000, one, in, in, in 1984, 83, 83 time frame, we, we lost money and we found that we are running out of cash to fund these projects we, are, we have going. Now keep in mind, we, we, we are shipping tape and disk drives in the marketplace. Tape was always doing well. We have never really had any problem in shipping tape equipment. Was a success. Some of your, some of your alumni like to say tape made money and disk spent it. Well, disk did pretty good too. As all these projects they did, but I think what happened is disk, this the 8650, the the. The snag we had there that cost us. Yeah. Uh, the was, money we spent on the extra money we spent, the, the, we we got a little bit. <clears throat> financially, we became strapped because we could not. We have we have a bank line with Citibank plus others. Then we had other l loans from other organizations for different projects. So our financial people were really very. Um, innovated by going to all kinds of sources to raise money for the things we're doing. And those, some of those little banks or the small loans, 10 million here, 5 million there, so on. When we lost money in 2000, one, in 1983, uh, we get into 84, we made, I made a decision that we really can't afford the CPU and a lot of everything else. So I shut it down. Of course, we had to take, take a ride down. That made the financials look really bad. It helped us in trying to, to slow the cash burn, but it made the financials look bad. And some of those banks won their money back. We go to our syndicate. They said, no way they're going to extend any more money to, to, to to pay those guys off. So we're getting here caught with, we don't have any more money. Um, that was the beginning of the, what ended up being fighting for chapter 11. Now, obviously this, nobody was filed for any chapter 11, but we had these sharp guys that came to us through the board, one of the board members from New York, financial people say, hey look, what, many people have done this. You could do the same thing. As a matter of fact, um, I can't remember exactly who it was, but known, I think it was Continental Airlines have done that. You actually, f you file for Chapter 11, provided you have the right people lined up ahead of time to lend you the money that you need. And once, if you do that, they, they can lend you money and you can lose the money to do what you want to do. So we went to Chemical Bank and a couple of other banks, and we got a commitment for them to invest or to, to lend us $150 million, which will take care of the, the shortfall we had. And uh, with that in hand, 
we were told that you do fire for chapter 11, you take care of all the people that you have in here, and within a couple of months you'll be out of it. It sounded like it's reasonable. The board met, we discussed it. They all agreed just with, the, with that commitment, it's, it's fine. So we filed for chapter 11. Uh, I should add, we, the company had assets of about $1.2 billion, liabilities of all, all kinds, about $750 million. So we have a lot of assets in the company. So we were not really going broke in any way, but just, just we don't have the cash to, to do things. So with the commitment for a loan, of $150 million, we filed for Chapter 11. A week later, Chemical Back came back and said, sorry, we're going to cancel that commitment. Now, it was very unexpected, but that delayed the whole process, obviously. You cannot get out in two months when you don't have fun, funds to pay the little bags to get them off your back. And so that was the beginning of that. But still, the company was there. One of the biggest concerns we have, is this going to make our customers unhappy? Are we going to be able to, is it going to make it so that we cannot sell more equipment? But really, it does not have much negative effect on the, on the business. As a matter of fact, <coughs> we, we were protected from having to pay all these people we, we own money to. So therefore, the cash coming in kind of help run the business very successfully. Now with that happening, obviously you get people like Citibank, who's a major, our major investor, very up in arms. Of course, the first thing they thought they should do is that they gotta get rid of Mr. Aweda. I mean, Beck is always, he's, a, he's CEO, he's gotta go. New face. New face, get some new face in here. You know, uh, looking at it at the time, I thought we were really, you know, if I got to where we are, I could take it out of there. But you know, I like to build businesses. I like to kind of try to kind of massage them afterwards or just manage things. Uh, getting in, I've been actually in the process of trying to get a chief operating officer for a while. We actually hired a guy from GE. It did not work out too good. Then I had Naeem, my brother, who was actually in, in the sales uh, organization. Naeem is a, is a great negotiator. He did a lot of negotiating the, some of the deals we have done, uh, the OEM deals we have done. So the board thought it would be a great guy to have him to be the chief operating officer. We had him to be chief operating officer, but he really wasn't quite, uh, this was the, the timing was wrong for anybody to do anything there. So they wanted somebody else to come in. I said, okay, I would, look, I would stay as a chairman of the board and get somebody else in. One of the people that kind of was available was Ralph Poppy. And I knew Poppy. I said, you know, this would be a good guy to come because Riley, the, big, the biggest problem I have was with these bankers. I mean, they're really all over us. They were trying to control everything. I said, Ryle is the kind of guy who speaks only to God. And these bankers are not going to have much effect on him. So I had the board interviewed him, plus many others. He wasn't really the number one choice for everybody, but they bought the idea he's, he'd be good. So he came in to run the company. and. Uh, And I became just a chairman on the side. Now, for a guy who's been running the company for doing all the decisions for it, building it from scratch, I was. I mean, I didn't want to second guess the guy. I don't want to be there. Let him do it. I'll, I'll be out of there. So I, uh, a couple of yeah, what, two, three months after, I, I resigned my position as a chairman. Uh, <clears throat> maybe it's the it's next stage in here. Or what? What, yes. oh, you want it's, to take a uh, break now? It's now 11 o'clock. Uh, we're actually re really going quickly, which is great. Uh, do you want to take a quick break now? Or you want to continue and then break for lunch? I'd, I'd like to step back now and talk about some of the programs that okay. happened, you know, the optical program, a little more on the disc. Um, and then, uh, 
we can go from there into your post storage technology uh, experiences. So it's up to you. You want to take a break? You want to keep going? Well, I'd like to kind of finish that before we take a break. Okay, uh, sure. Do it. Uh, go maybe. And go for out for lunch. We can go out to have lunch. Yeah. Okay. Where do you want to go? Let's continue with. Uh, you want to go continue with the. Uh, I don't know how much further you want to go with the storage technology store story. Uh, you're, you've talked about recruiting Poppy. Your resignation from the board is, is one of the questions that comes up is one of the key successes under Poppy was the uh, library product, the 4400. Yeah, you know, I saw that in the documents that, that I was against it. And yeah, that's it really wasn't, that was not really a true statement. Uh, the, we could not afford to build a product is what I was uh, a library project of that type was being proposed by the people. We, my take was put that off on the side because we, what we have going, we could not afford it. Given the current situation. Right, I'm talking about in, in, in 83, 84 time frame. Uh, it, it was, people would say, we can do a library like this kind of library. And, and, um, it's going to, you know, any project like that is going to take a certain amount of resources. We were pretty tight cash-wise. We didn't have the resources to, to, to have another major product. So I was going to say, put that off, worry about it later. So when he uh, got there, I think we, under Chapter 11, there was, there was, there was cash available to do things with. As I understand it, it was a lot of cash available. Uh, yeah, because people were collecting revenues from customers, but not paying the loans or to, uh, I guess, leasing companies. We're not paying, we're not paying out, but we're collecting money in. Well, as I understand it, the the uh, because of the way your leases were set up, because the money flowed into a storage technology account, right, and then flowed out to a leasing company. Right, correct. Once you enter Chapter Eleven. Those payments. We didn't have to take it out. We just received them and we kept them. You kept them. That's so, right. I mean, so the resources were an there. Enormous to, cash, positive right. cash flow. I should add, but also at that time, there was no, no disk program and no CPU program, which we were developing before the Chapter 11. They were gone because we killed both of those. And therefore, there's the engineering people are available to build something different. That's how the library came about. Okay, now, now there was also a uh, microelectronics pro uh, project or company set up separate from the uh, computer company. At least with what I read in the uh, literature, there was a, you had a, a microelectronics development organization which was set up as a separate entity, which was also shut down. Does that ring a bell or am I confused? We have bought a small company in New York City or in New Jersey that is developing some microelectronics. Micro identity. It was a very small little entity. We shut it down, but that was very insignificant. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So we we didn't have any 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 of these things going on. All we had basically is at at that time, at following the chapter eleven. After that, well, at that time, we had no CPU, we didn't have no 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 uh, optical disk. We have the other products, the disk drives, tape drives, and the library not the library the the the, the printer was still there, but we somehow did something with it afterwards. So there were there were available resources and people people to to mm -hmm. develop something more in the peripheral, mar peripheral area. And I think that's what the library came about. Mm -hmm. Tell me about the optical project. You know, looking at storage medium, both tape and disc, we concluded that we've taken tape 
to higher and higher densities, we can take a step up like a factor of maybe 10 by going to optical recording rather than magnetic recording. So we analyzed that market area. We kind of got, got excited about the potential. So we set an operation up in, in Longmont, Colorado here. I had Juan Rodriguez in charge of it to build the optical product. One of the problems was there's no media available, so we have to also manufacture the media for the optical product, which also was set up in the same location. We worked out a relationship with DuPont. For them, they actually invented, uh, invested in the optical program because they liked that what we were doing in the media era, media era that could be, could be quite substantial. So it was our next storage product to be much higher capacity and um, I think it probably we thought of it as a tape um, follow-on product, not necessarily a disc product, but a tape type product with large capacity. That was, what, that was the concept behind it. We have the, the tape drives we were building, they have doubled the capacity on and now we can go a factor of 10 rather than double, and we thought it was very appealing. Now, for whatever reason, the product was, we tested it, it was performing, but not quite ready for the market at that time frame. And it was a little bit behind schedule also. So we found ourselves short of money. We could not finance it. And that's when we decided time to end it. That's just about the same time when we were having difficulty in trying to get the banks to, give, to extend the loans we have with them. Again, it's money resources that to us, we, you can't do it. I, the one who was heading it was Juan Rodriguez. And probably if you interviewed with Ron, probably he would have told you more about what the technology was and what he was going on. Uh, it was a good product, but it never really got close enough to being a shippable product. And we needed a little more time, a little more, well, more time and more money to make it happen. And we were out of money. Was there an attempt to spin it out as a separate entity? Yes. Yeah, we tried that. As, as a matter of fact, we, we Several of the people that we have talked to about trying to fund it, uh, I'm just trying to think back about two people I know we've talked about. They just we did not, we could not see enough. Maybe there's interest, but not interest enough to put to say ten twenty million dollars in it. So we, it didn't happen. As a matter of fact, I should add. Other people have tried optical devices like that, and it seems they always end up dying. Maybe for the same reason. The, the technology is, you can show it as exciting, but to make it as, as a, as a uh, reliable product with the capacities needed to make it meaningful. I mean, I mean it, it has to have a certain, it is so you can handle, um, certain capacity and performance with magnetic tape. To go to optical, you got to see at least maybe four times. And so what we found out that to do that, it wasn't quite, we were not quite there. We, we couldn't do it, other, pe other people d couldn't do it either. They're actually optical disc device, the people working on that now, but they still can't make it so that economically it makes sense. It, it makes sense when you, if you can really prove that it can perform at the much higher capacities for the cost of the product. But when you start degrading the capacity and the performance to make it reliable, you lose the advantage. And that's where we were. That seems to be always the story of optical. They, they're always 10 times better, but not this year, 
five years from now, yeah. and five years from now, uh, absolutely. it doesn't work. Always, it's going to be 10 times better, it's, it's so exciting, yeah. But then, are you there? Well, no, we're not there, we're going to get there. You don't get there. No, but that's so And so, it, it was, I think, the team of guys doing it, they're good, they could have performed, but they probably needed a lot more time, a lot more money to be spent to make it happen. Right in the middle of your difficulties, yeah. I guess rumors about what became the 3480 start circulating. Uh, I know you started a MR head program in storage technology before the 3480 was announced. How did, how, how was the 3480 and its uh, potential introduction a factor at all in some of the problems that you were having? Not at all? Well, you know, we, we got into the making the, the head, the, the read-write head operation. We, we, in, in Boulder and here, we had a little facility where we could manufacture that. Uh, Richard D., at that time, he had to share the clean room with the optical folks because there wasn't money to build a separate clean room yeah. for for the head program, which, of course, was the future of the tape business, which sort of an indication of the financial challenges that yeah, you were yeah. you were going. I think Richard joined Storage Tech in '82. Yeah, for, yeah, yeah, for, yeah, about that time frame. I think we, some of the decisions made trying to make heads rather than early on when we were, got into the tape business, we did not make the tape head drive. We bought them. It was a very good relationship we had with, with the manufacturer of the heads. As you get into, as you get into the, the, the disc drive area, you start making those heads and it becomes very, very demanding technology. Uh, we decided that um, we would like to do it ourselves rather than dip it on somebody else to do it. And it was very, 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 it was very difficult, very difficult. I don't think we were very successful at it. You, you never, did you ever make uh, conventional nine track heads? I don't think so. No, nine tracks, no. I'm talking we did the, the disc the heads, MR. but not tape. Never made any tape heads. Until the uh, MR head. That's right. Yeah. But the work started early, even before IBM had announced. You know, I'm just trying to um, think back about about that. I'm sure you know you're you're very versed in the, in the disc part of the business. <laughs> uh, it did. We started long before because that was the product we were doing. Our, our first disk product developed by Storage Tech was that product. And so we took it and we tried to kind of get into the double density quickly as we could possibly do. Um, yeah, but that was, that was uh, just thin film heads. The MR, MR was first introduced in tape and yeah. only much later got introduced in, in disk. I mean, the first. MR head commercially shipped was the IBM 3480, which I think was announced in 84, shipped in 85. Yeah. And so you were working on MR, 18 track MR heads in 82, uh, Richard. Yeah, but I, I don't, I can't recall if we ever had any of those drives in the, in the 82, 83 time frame. No. I don't think so. No. The, the, we were developing them, but... You were developing the head. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, anticipating that that was... A oh, yeah, yes, it, it's going to be happening, yeah. It was going to happen. And ultimately, after you left, uh, I guess, STC man manufactured its MR heads for all of its products starting in the late 80s. Yeah. Okay. Um, how far did the... Uh, you said the computer project was a mid-range it, it was a mid-range computer. Sort of in the class of what a 
148 or uh, what? What would, can you tell me a little bit more about the target in the market and how far you got when you were, when you had to shut it down? You know, you have the <clears throat> large large mainframe. You have the small computers, and you have middle size. We're in the, that middle range is what we were trying to 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 build, and uh, <clears throat> you know it's a good question. We were about two years into the project, and we thought we'd have a product to get to the market as initial customership in that time frame, but we were still about a year away from having it available for the market. And uh, the problems, I guess, were just basic problems. You know, you, you build a computer, you gotta, you gotta make sure that it's debugged, the functions perform as, as specified, uh, they have to integrate all the peripherals with I mean, what you need with a computer is that to be able to have all the attachments to it, everything working. And um, other than the, the CPU does certain, does the function at a certain speed, you know, you can do that fairly quickly, but then now you, all, the, all the interactions with the different part of the system, the, that was, it was not happening. I would say we were away still about a year from having a, 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 a prototype to show to anybody. And that is about a year behind schedule. Mm -hmm. Was it your own operating system? Was it going to be no. IBM compatible? But, IBM compatible, yes. But, but at, by that point, IBM was making, uh, well, they'd, they'd unbundle, I'm not sure it was, uh, uh, they were making it hard to make a computer to run its, its operating systems. That was my recollection. Maybe I, I may be confused. Well, the guys we had on the job, they felt that they can use the IBM operating system. I mean, they, they felt that they could do it. Okay. It just it didn't happen. I mean, or they're slow to getting there. Mm -hmm. uh, okay. Now, the question becomes, why did we, did we try to invent some major things with that CPU? The answer is no. We just wanted to have a CPU in the middle, middle range that we add all the peripherals to it and ship it to the same customers that are buying our peripherals. It was more like a complementary type mm -hmm. product. You know, as a matter of fact, thinking back, we did have a, a product we developed and we killed it, uh, a tape product, the low-end tape drive, uh, kind of low cost, low performance, In the probably in the this is tape, not disc now. In the 78, 79 time frame, we could not make it. We could not get that product built at a reasonable cost. Are you talking about the 1900 series? That, that's the tape. tape. I'm not product. sure we had it. No, well, it could have been. I don't remember. I don't remember the name of the, of the series, but it was a, a low cost tape drive. Mm -hmm. Very simple machine, not vacuum calls, but real-to-real -real type of product. Mm -hmm. uh, we we were trying to build something that that could be used with other people with other CPUs other than mm -hmm. IBM CPUs. Yeah, but my notes know, my notes show a product which had that number. Yeah, that, as could, an that OEM could be product. the one. Yeah, and it uh, we 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 killed it because we could not make it at the cost required cost. Mm -hmm. You, know, you can build it, it works, but it costs too much money. Okay. Any yeah. recollections about the cyber cache? No, I, I know the name is familiar to me, but I don't remember exactly what, uh, what, uh, what, uh, what well, it's, it was. It's sort of, it's one uh, of the uh, first, if not the first, pure caching storage device. Uh, well, that's, that's probably what I call the, 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 the solid state disk. Okay, there were, yeah. there, there was two products actually, I think. Another one was the, uh, let's see, how did, what did you call it? Uh, 
It was a 2305, they call it the 4305. It was a 2305 replacement. 2305 was the IBM fixed disk. So it was a disk drive, but it was a multi-heads, multi, uh, eight heads per, eight tracks per head. It's an eight track per head disk drive, which also seeped across the server. Very high data rate and storage. I don't think we did that. No, you didn't do that at all. No, Nobody no, did that. No. Only IBM could do that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But what you did was a, called a 4305, which was a solid state device, did, which looked like a 2305 yes, we to did the that. operating yes, system. Yes, we did that. We actually had multiple. We had the basic solid state issue. We have an upgrade of that, what you're talking about, the super mm -hmm. cache. And those were successful products, actually. And it was... But, but the only problem with that is we buy in all the semiconductor devices from Intel and others, and we are their mercy from a cost point of view. So you, you got to make it competitive, and it was very tough for us to make it competitive. Yeah, it was a, a small market, too, uh, yeah, the, well, the, mainly on the very high-end mainframes where they put paging files and stuff on the, on the 2305, and your product was much yeah. faster. And, and had yeah. essentially no access delay at all. So it, it really helped those systems. Well, we kind of always thought that a solid state disk is a good thing to have, to add to the to product line, because mm -hmm. if you can make it cheap enough, it, it could fit a gap in, in, in a marketplace. Okay. But, but again, the, the pricing, chip pricing was the obstacle there. Okay. Intel was doing it themselves. They're making the, the chips and they're making the product. So they're tough to compete with them. So that's why we, that, pro, that project did not continue to grow. Mm -hmm. Well, and uh, it turned out it was better to put a cache in a control unit yeah. at the head of a string of tape or disk than to have a separate a high performing device the, the way That's it's probably over. true. Yeah, so yeah, 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 yeah. So, so you eliminated the need to have a separate box. You eliminated the whole function yeah. disappeared yeah. or or put that information in main storage. You know, the, the function disappeared in the 80s. By the end of the 70s, it was, it was going away. And yeah. today, we, we just don't do that anymore. Uh, we just don't build computers that way. It was a, a, a niche market, and the niche disappeared, as I understand it. But. Uh, I don't know if it's complete. We, we did a lot. We did a lot with that. We, I know we we have two models of it, and they we, they sold. They were kind of easy to maintain, but we didn't make any money out of them. <laughs> you know, it just uh, you have to buy those chips, and you're at the mercy of the manufacturer. Right. The, the, you know, right. Uh, the, the Ninety percent of the cost of goods yeah, sold exactly, were the yeah. chips. Yeah, and. Uh, and of course, the IBM 2305 was priced quite high, but you know, there's just not not that much margin. That's right. Yeah. Okay. okay. So, is there anything else you would like to talk about from the product point of view, product or market or finance from the storage tech point? Well, you know, one thing, one thing I didn't mention in here that you know we did actually make OEM sales. Yes. After we had the product working and being sold to the users, we found ourselves talking to Univac and others about buying product from us on an OEM basis, which we did sell them. It was just part of the business for us to add on. It wasn't the primary part of the business, but it was complementary business. Uh, and that is, I think, again, the success we had was in the fact we were end user supplier. We were directly with the users. Uh, and then it looked like the OEM business was was like gravy added to what we were doing there. So that, that, was, that was good. And it was a net 30 cash dip business. Exactly, right? exactly, yep. Although sometimes they may yeah. not pay net 30. Yeah. One thing that else I would add, you know, I talk about we have built a strong sales and service organization. Now we did that worldwide. Yeah. I mean, domestically we were all over to the major locations. Then we went into Europe and we were in Japan and, you know, so we were selling products all over. Uh, <clears throat> we had, uh, because we're in manufacturing, today people don't manufacture, but at the time we were manufacturing. And uh, we had about 
the highest number of employment, we had about 16,000 employees. About 10,000 of those were in the bowl in here, here in the Long March, you know, in, in, in Colorado. So we had a lot, a lot of employees working in the company, uh, which is kind of nice. I, I still like the idea of manufacturing products. It's unfortunate that uh, the economics are such. You know, it's funny. <clears throat> I remember going to, where was it? Uh, it wasn't China, it was Singapore. I watched the, the uh, Seagate plant building disk drive in, uh, over there, Singapore. I went to the plant. It's an automated facility. They had maybe about 10 people. I said, you know, why do we actually do it in Singapore? Why not do it here? It's only 10 people. Automate the whole process and 10 people. And so what's going on in China right now is the same thing. They automate everything that you could say, well, we can do the same thing here. For some reason, people have it in their mind that, hey, you go over there, those guys will pay you off in, in the beginning. You don't have to set it up, you have to pay the tooling, what have you. They take care of it. They're smart people. They take the business away that way. <laughs> Which is actually another subject we could talk about, but uh, you, you, we talked about financing becoming essentially dominating your role. That's right. Uh, not in the business plan, the recognition you got into and obviously got very good at. The other thing not, not in the business plan, and you've talked about it, is the, the sales and service organization's requirement. Yes. I mean, in the OE business, you sell a product to a customer, he maintains it. It's his, he sells it to his customer. When you're selling to the IBM compatible market, you need a major investment in sales and service. Right. How did you, how quickly did that become a, pro, a, a challenge for you in growing your business? You know, as I mentioned earlier, that we hired the guy to head that activity. Right. Right in the beginning. So he actually was involved in with engineering in making sure the product is tested, checked out, working before it's shipped to to the, to the marketplace. He brought in some salespeople, brought in some, we hired some service people. It became very clear to us that we are on the right track and we can, we can build products because we have customers. The customer is our sales organization. Now, the biggest problem with that is when you're selling it to a customer, normally you get paid. Mm -hmm. When you're leasing it to him, you don't get paid. And you can't finance at least. You get paid monthly. Paid monthly. And that is, that is something that, before, when we realize that that's the case, we found ourselves spending a lot of time in finding ways to finance that business, which is raising money, working with leasing companies, and trying to maybe get OEM business on the side, whatever it is, to be able to finance this growth. As I understand that market, um, one of the problems when you want to sell to a Ford or Bank of America, is you can have a salesman fly into Ford or fly into Bank of America, but they're going to want service people in 15 different locations. Yep. So right from the beginning, when you're, oh, yeah. when you're, you know, you're, you're growing your company, challenge is, you know, how do I have a physical presence where my customers demand it. I mean, you know, you hire a salesman, fine. A salesman can cover a territory, but a installation needs a service person close by. And, they need, and all of they, a sudden you're- They need 24 you're, hour per day service support. And also yeah, yeah. Your, your growth of your, you know, the, your growth of your sales and your service force is just uh, a big expense and a big recruitment challenge. Right up, right up front. It was, it was. As a matter of fact, as I mentioned, we had limited number of salespeople. Right. Very effective and very good. But when they sold something, you have to have service people service it. So the service organization was about much larger than the sales organization. And by the way, I'm just trying to think about how to put that. 
service was a very profitable business for the company. You know, what you charge for servicing the product was very profitable. And we had to be in locations all over the place. So when you, anytime you have a sales office, maybe you'd have a salesman, but maybe you have 10 service people. I don't think we had any service locations where there are no sales coverage. They all have sales coverage, but, but there are usually many, sales, many more service people in the field than sales people. And that's, that's, you're right. I mean, you find yourself no longer in a building products business. You are in a selling and servicing products. And as I described so far is that our second product we bought from somebody else just to add to what we have because we can, we can sell it. Uh, it is funny you see that today in a lot of ma people who don't manufacture anything but they sell, you know. <laughs> so, so in a way we're doing that in the computer business. And they don't service it either, you throw it out. <laughs> oh, that's true too, that's true too. Let me think in here. Well, I think the mainframe business today, it's, it's still a, for IBM, I think it's still a $10 billion a year business. Uh, it's the same thing. They, it they hasn't have, changed much. They, they have to service, they That's have right. room full of equipment. The, and there are now many people servicing the environments. So it's, uh, I mean... The, oh, you need service. And, and, you know, and people are willing to pay for it. So it's, it's uh, uh, I know Howard Derby, who was heading our service organization. He's quite a dynamo. Uh, you know, he says, hey, we make money in service. We can supply the service, but we can make it at it. You know, it's, it's uh, maybe a couple of little things, maybe anecdotes in here, but um, one of the early customers we have, have was Ford Motor Company. And uh, I'm talking about within the first six months we had Ford Motor Company. So they want to come and see us before they, they were sold that, you know, we can do something for you. So they fly six of their executives to come to Boulder in here to see our 2,600 foot facility where we manufacture the product. And they place an order. And uh, before very long, we had a lot of, we, we still, I guess, a lot of business with Ford Motor Company. Um, EDS, Ross Perot's company, they're, uh, they kind of proud, they're proud of the fact that they know computers, they know what they're doing, they can service customers. They're one of our early customers as well. And uh, I remember how we got that business is that uh, they had some tapes they could not read on IBM equipment. And our sales here, we can read it for you. So they gave them the tapes, and exactly where we did that, I don't know where, but anyway, we read them, said, God damn it, fine, we'll buy, we'll buy a bunch of your drives. And that was the beginning of that. Um, so there, there, we had a lot of successes as you went in because the product was working well. But that was, again, um, it's interesting, if you take a look at, we were tape and disc, and primarily really tape and disc was added later. The other things we tried to do did not work out too good. Printer was no big deal, CPU never happened, optical did not happen, but this continued to be a success. Um, I mean, tape continued to be a success. Mm -hmm. We did... Into this century, actually. That's right, that's right. No. Even right now, Today, I just heard recently about IBM technologists are storing so much data on tape that what, like on a small little cartridge, you have as much as you had in a whole library. That, that may, they may be cheating a bit there, though. Well, maybe they are, but, but the fact is, uh, the whole idea was of the optical disc was instead of having to have huge stacks of reels of tape, maybe you'd have only two, three, or four um, optical discs. 
I mean, you reduce the size significantly, you know. Mm -hmm. yeah. But the, the, the problem with optics has been lasers are difficult and optics is old. Yeah. And so, the, you know, the, 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 they, they can't produce an X-ray ray laser, which they'd have to produce to produce a spot size small enough to match the density that those IBM guys were were demonstrating. I mean, the, yeah. the reality is magnetic density is higher than optical density by an order of magnitude or two. So yeah, if, you, yeah, if yeah. you just read or write it on tape or disc, who needs optics? I mean, that, that's that's the, yep, that's the dilemma of optics. Which yeah, somehow, be, somehow, you know, you always think up, optical recording is the way to go. It isn't. It isn't. It hasn't proven. It hasn't. It has not been proved to be that way. Jumping way back in time, just make sure the record is complete. You're a golfer and a skier. 30 days of skiing last That's winter. That's right. That's right. Uh, any other avocations uh, besides your grandchildren golfing and skiing? Well, I'll tell you, my, my schedule nowadays is running also. I run, golf, and ski. Of course, you don't ski in, a, in the summer, but you ski in the winter, and you can golf year around if you go someplace where they do have golf. You go to Hawaii, you go someplace that's warm. I do like to run, and I don't run that much, but we have a race here in town, the Boulder Boulder Race, 10K. I do that every year. And you win it many years. And in, in, being in my age group, it goes, you know, by the year, I win that every year because of whatever reason, you know. I guess some people drop out as they get older. If you stay in there, eventually you'll, you'll win, yeah. Now, I've been winning, winning that for the many, many years now, yeah. And I trained for it, though. It doesn't just happen. I trained for it. And the uh, younger limit in your age group is 70, 75? No, no. Actually, that is my age. Oh, your age. I'm so 86, it's everybody... 86. So... The year by year. So it's a year by year. Oh, yeah. it's not a... They have one at Martha's Vineyard where we have a summer house. We go there. There, it's 80 and over. It's kind of interesting. This year, I went there and I ran that. It's a 5K. And... All these guys who just turned 80, they're there, they thought they could really win it. Kids. No, huh? build, I won it. You won it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. That, that one is 80 and over. But anyway, it's, it's sort of, the main thing is really, it's fun to do, but also it gives you something to motivate you to actually do, run periodically. To, you know, it's, it's good for you to run. It's good for me to, to stay in shape. Wow. Yeah. And ski in the same thing. Yeah. No, that's... Uh... Good luck in your next 10K. Thank you, thank you. So we had pretty much covered storage technology I think in so. the morning session. I think so. I, uh, I, I, you know, it's... Uh, any other key players we didn't talk about that you'd like to m mention who made major contributions at STK? We talked about Zal, we talked about... Well, Warner. I'll tell you, one guy we haven't really talked much about, which who headed the service organization, okay. Howard Derby. I think he did an awesome job in making sure product worked, here in the factory, we fine, and in the field. If there's a field problem, he took it upon himself, hitting that whole organization of, I don't know, maybe a couple of thousand people. He goes there himself sometimes. He works over the night to make sure what the problem is solved, especially early on when we had, you know, we're still trying to build up the business. That was a very key employee there in the business. Um, I mentioned my brother Naeem was came in there you know, early on to help us negotiate deals. He did a lot of negotiating deals with the OEMs, and uh, uh, not with the end user, but with OEMs, and also with suppliers and things like that. He did a, he did a very good job there. And he lives here in Colorado, by the way. Uh, let me see who else. Um, you know, I know the, the initial technical team very well because those are the ones who came with me from IBM right in the beginning. And we talked about some of those, uh, uh, other than Juan and Zoll, uh, then Barry Cunningham and Eric Winjob and uh, Gus Sapina. You know, they're, uh, they're, 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 uh, many of them are still around here. Mm -hmm. Very few went to Arizona, but they're still here, most of them. Well, if, you, if anybody's name comes up, when you review the transcript, just, just go ahead and add it. Yeah. You know, this, you know, it's sort of, and if you even want to add a brief description of why you name them, 
That's what the transcript is for. Yeah, yeah, I understand. Recollection. I understand. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Now we, you mentioned twice talking to Memorex about relationships. Yeah. First with uh, Larry Spitters very early, and then later on, uh, when I think with Bob Wilson and Memorex. With Bob Wilson and myself, the discussion was that it would be fantastic if we get the two companies together, make basically have a merger of the two companies. And we've talked about that. Uh, and uh, as a matter of fact, we even have it, it, we've put a draft together for that merger. Um, frankly, looking back at it right now, it's hard for me to imagine why it did not go through. It did not happen. Um, whether it was they backed out or we did, I think maybe, could have been us rather than him, I don't know. But uh, the way he put it, is, this would have been, this would be a major made in heaven if it, if it happens, but it didn't happen. Um, probably the timing of that must have been like the nine, 1980, about that time frame. Yeah, I think Will, uh, Wilson retired around 80 or 81. Well, it must have been just before that. Just, and then Clancy Spangle was hired as a replacement, and then Unisys acquired Memorex. So probably that was 79 before or 80. That. Was before that. I could look up Bob Wilson's uh, retirement date, but it was... It, it was... Maybe he was looking for something to do with Memorex before he retired. Maybe that's the timing. But it wasn't... Um, yeah, I... I I don't think it was before 78, maybe as late as 80, 81, but in that time, time frame. Yeah. Yeah. Personally, I agree with you. Had it gone forward, yeah. I think it would have been a merger made in heaven. Yeah, but, yeah. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Uh, uh, yeah. Hindsight is... Well, you know, just a little, maybe something else. Boulder here, this area here, has a lot of startups that came out from storage be, be, during or you know before the storage um, five for chapter 11 and after uh, like we talked about uh, uh, we talked about different people in here but uh, the, what I was leading to is that one guy put together how many people, left storage to start businesses in the Boulder area, and the number was 32. The 32 businesses were st started out in this area from by ex-storage tech employees. Many of them actually started the business while the storage tech was still going big guns and I was over there. We really encourage people to be independent. If they want to do something their own, all power to you. We really did not say, okay, you take it, state, you know, company secrecy going here and try to kind of stop. We didn't stop anybody. You want to do it? Good luck to you. Somebody, somebody was there. I'm talking about different kinds of fields too. Not all developing products. Some in the leasing business, um, some in the component development business. Um, 32. A lot of companies brought in the idea of doing something on their own to what they, and they've done, they've done something about it, yeah. As an aside, Juan gave me a box full of clippings. Juan Rodriguez gave me a box full of clippings that yeah. he collected yeah. over the years, mainly a local newspapers. Uh, the, the, uh, yeah, probably is, uh, the, 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 the Boulder, uh, Boulder paper. Yeah, Boulder paper, Rocky Mountain News, yeah. a couple of Denver's. And I was struck as I went through it by the uh, <coughs> entrepreneurial nature in the Boulder area. Oh yeah. There are several articles about companies <coughs> in, in a variety of areas that started up here. And I didn't see the number 32, but it's clear in the articles that I read that there were many startups yeah. had spun out of uh, storage technology. Yeah, there's quite a few, quite fairly a few. Successful. Yeah, yeah. Was Terry Johnson and Miniscribe one of those? Uh, 
Yep, he was one of the guys who left. Yep. Did, did, did he actually? Were you aware of it when he when he? Oh yeah, oh yeah, yeah. I, 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 Terry, when he left storage, he said he got the job done. There's not much to do, not exciting anymore. He wants to go out and see if he do something exciting. That was back the, his story. Actually, I, I had a chit chat with him on why you're leaving, Terry. And that was his story. I'm getting bored here. I want to go do something more exciting. Even though that was probably the time that the uh, uh, double density 3350 class product was having a lot of field problems. Yeah, it could have been the time, yeah, yeah. But he was getting kind of bored with that, oh. whatever it was doing. Um, so he wanted to do something yeah. more exciting. Uh, Tom Cavanaugh left early on to start a company. That was probably in the mid 70s. He thought he'd be happier doing something on his own. Uh, let me see. They, they, you know, it just, if you look at uh, maybe those clippings, you'll find a lot of people left to do something uh, while the company is still moving forward and growing, but they feel that they can do something on their own. Uh, and we kind of encourage that. We, um, I'm just trying to think. You know, storage tech, now, I left storage tech uh, in, 85, 1985, and uh, I mentioned a little earlier that one of the motivation why I resigned off the board because I was going to get into the disk drive business by acquiring the uh, CDC's disk drive op operation and figured McGuire was going to be with me, he would build up the sales and service and sell that product into the marketplace. It did not happen. I mean, the, we could not make the deal because somehow it seemed they kept on changing what they want for the business, get to the point it didn't make any sense, we did not do it. But we did invest in, in um, mini, in a, let me describe, in, in, uh, uh, in a tape drive company we actually merged my operation with a tape with a with a small tape drive company. This is Aspen Peripherals. Yes, and we sold that to storage. After that, um, we invested in a leasing company, Lista Corporation here in town, and we sold that to um, a major banking institution. So we we've been you know, I've been fairly active in. Uh, in the venture business after that, not many in a, in, a, in a storage area. Somehow, out of the ones I discussed, it's been more, we, we, some of the venture investments we made were in, a, in a, um, medical devices, we have some, some in software, uh, we have some in services, you know, different kinds of businesses. Now, now this is as a, a WIDA a a venture. venture capital. Yeah, that's right. You set that up in 85? In, uh, um, after resigning from the board? Or? Yes, after resigning from the board. And yeah. it's, we're sitting in your offices today. Still, that's right. Still so, going. Still, still going. Still going. Yeah. Uh, and um, we've done some real estate development. So, you know, it's sort of like a, you can't just sit idle. I'm, I'm not retiring. I don't believe in retirement. I keep doing things. So I keep on doing that. Um, I look back at the storage tech days, a phenomenal time we've had over there, uh, and uh, think about sometimes how things could have turned out a bit differently. But, you know, that's history. That's history. So could you talk a bit about your Aspen peripherals? investment. You had said earlier storage technology couldn't make a low-cost OEM drive. Did yes. Aspen? Uh, what Aspen did, did their own drive at Storage Tech. We killed the project because we somehow we could not see it go down to a, a, a manufacturing cost that we could sell it profitably. Aspen had a product that they were developing that looked like it it can meet the marketplace uh, and um, I know Siemens was one of the uh, 
customers of their, theirs. I think, the, the, I think, I don't know who else, to, they, they had several customers. And um, Siemens made an offer to buy the company. And then Storch Tech decided, hey, why let Siemens have it? We'd like to buy it. So they ended up buying it instead, which is was fine with me. Um, why do you think Aspen could make the cost objective and storage well, it's different, different. You, couldn't. you know, it's funny. Storage could have done it too, except the mental set of the people involved with the program was one of, you can have all these bells and whistles in it to make it just like the other product line. And you start adding all that stuff, to, hardware to it, it's not going to, do you need it? I mean, today you can buy tape drives that don't have the simple, just move from reel to reel with read right head, very simple. Uh, that doesn't, don't cost much money, but they, they do the job. So you don't have to have all the performance functions that you have in the major tape subsystem in a small drive. You gotta cut out some of that stuff. It's not needed. And I think at storage we did not cut anything out. We, could, we had this had a spec too, too, too rich with features. Aspen on the other hand said, hey, look, we don't need all this stuff. They that design with that with in mind, hey, I want to be able to sell this and make a profit. And uh, maybe they learned from what we, what we did at storage, you know? Some of the guys were the same people. Yeah. So give, give us a feel of what sort of cost objective we're talking about. Are we talking manufacturing costs of a few hundred dollars, a few thousand dollars? You know, what... what, what we're what talking you... about manufacturing costs in... The way I remember it, in the maybe $800 range. Okay. And, this, uh, is at a, this is to be a successful OEM product. That's correct, yeah. At the, in the late 80s. That's right. So, to frame it. Yeah, and the one that storage would be, was what cost us twice as much. That. Now, we, we did not, maybe part of it, we did not take the effort to say, okay, now we have it, it costs so much, what, how can you cut the cost in half? Cost in half? We didn't go through that step. For whatever reason, we just said, look, Forget about it. At storage tech. At storage tech, yeah. Um, yeah, that's not unlike the story I heard at IBM San Jose with regard to small disk drives. The Jack Harker, who was a senior guy at San Jose for many years, yeah. when he saw the Shugart ST506, he said, we could never do that at IBM. Oh, really? Yeah. But it was the guys who did it. Were it's the same guys. They're from IBM. Not quite, but it's certainly a lot of IBM. There's the same thing in here. I don't think it was the fact we could not do it, but what we did was over, over, over designed, and we did not take the step to reduce the cost down. Right. Um, maybe part of that is analyzing who's going to buy it from us, what are they willing to pay for it, and with the effort involved. So, I mean, I don't. It wasn't a big thing for in the scheme of things at the time when that happened, you know. But we th were thinking, hey, let's take it down. They have something good for here. Let's take it down. And uh, looking back, I don't, th I don't think we gave it a chance to succeed in the down market. It could, we, we could have succeeded, but didn't give it a chance. Yeah. Yeah. To put it in perspective, in that same time period, I think the manufacturer, well. The the big disk drives at IBM was building thousands of dollars. Yeah. And, and the Shugart drive had a manufacturing cost under $100. I mean, so you get to sell hundreds of thousands of these, they'd be happy with a few thousand of those, you know, but it's a different market. It, and the market moved into that direction. You know? Well, and fortunate for Shugart, the, yeah. the personal computer took off. That's right. Because That's right. You, you would not sell a $100 disk drive into the mainframe market. That's right. That's right. Today you do, though. The same thing in the tape business. Yeah. But somehow the tape business never scaled the way the disk business. No, disk it did not. It did not. Is there anything else about Aspen? No, you merged really. with them, which, which is quite an endorsement. Yeah, you know, it's sort of like we felt here something worthwhile is join up forces with them, which we did that. And uh, 
I'm just trying to think. The timing was was right for us to do, uh, and uh, I was looking for some complementary type product to get involved in, and that was was tape and it fit, and it was nearby, right here. We know the people, you know, it was the right thing to do. Um, so we started with trying to do market somebody else's disk drives. It did not happen. We got into this one. We built up for, after a while. We sold it to storage. Um, I'm just trying to say uh, the... I think you told me offline that uh, your leasing investments were very profitable. Yeah, we made an investment uh, early on in leasing. And uh, as a matter of fact, it, it, it was... It, how should I put it? Financially was probably the best deal we have done. Uh, we uh, paid back the investment, then sold it for multi hundred million dollar uh, business. Well, our share was about 50% of that company. So it was it was a very lucrative business for us. Any particular leasing or just general leasing? In no, general? actually, started out by leasing uh, the same devices we manufacture storage tech. Okay. Tape drives, disk drives, uh, any kind of peripherals, uh, and uh, now we're, how did you service those? I mean, you were working with. So, I mean, as you as you know, leasing peripherals is a service intensive business. No, 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 this is a leasing company that did no servicing. All they did, they bought the equipment that's installed at the customer's location, is being serviced by the supplier. Okay. So, take an example of a disk drive installed at Bank of America. On lease? On a three-year lease. On lease to either a, a Memorex or a storage tech or an IBM. Whatever it is. And so, we end up buy it, we buy the equipment from the manufacturer, from, from IBM, not from IBM, but it's a Membrax or Storage Tech or whoever it is, the leasing company bought the product and paid cash for it. They collected their money plus a percentage of the residual. They owned the machine, basically. But the, the life was long enough for them to get make a profit out of it. And so they expanded into many different areas, product areas, and the volume became very significant. I think they, they, the, they had purchased, before we sold it, they purchased about two to three billion dollars worth of equipment. So it was, it, it's done well. Uh, and the key was the equipment had been installed by the original yeah. seller That's who right. had to provide service. Oh yeah. So they kept a service contract on it. Oh, absolutely. And essentially... Essentially, all we did just collect the rental, kept collecting rental from it, as far as as long as it was in, on lease. If it comes off lease, the manufacturer tried to re lease it again. You know, it's, it's basically not involved in servicing of the product, strictly in funding the lease on it. But that requires the goodwill of the original lessor, the original manufacturer, to continue the service and to provide the refurbishment and remarketing when it comes off lease, if it's financial. They have interest in it. Manufacturer has interest in the residual. Oh. Once you recover your investment, they share in the amount of money coming out of that. And it's what, part of the agreement that they service it. So you don't distinguish machine owned by the leasing company from one owned by the company itself or by a third party. So the manufacturer is, services all the equipment equally. Yeah, leasing, uh, it's kind of interesting, was very, uh, uh, I say profitable business, it was profitable, but it was, it played a part in selling products or leasing products to end users who were willing to sign a two year lease, but no more than that. And by the way, they also, this leasing company also leased products to could be medical devices, to hospitals, to dentists and the likes. It's the same kind of arrangement. It doesn't have to be computer equipment. But they had a lot of computer equipment in, in, in their portfolio. Um,
any other in investments as a venture capitalist that uh, you'd like to share with us? Well, we, uh, I'm just trying to think about some we invested and we got out of. We have uh, active right now a couple of investments in, in, in uh, medical devices. There's one where people who have problem, back problems, spinal problem, there's, there's growth around the, the spine that makes it so very painful. Uh, this company basically, uh, to do that, to, to solve that problem, you go, a surgeon opens up the back, cut out all the excess uh, tissue around the spinal cord, that whole area, and it's a major operation. What these guys do, they go in there with a, like, like a big needle into the back, and they, they go in inside the needle, they have like a little cutter. It cuts that material, take it out, all like in an outpatient department. You, know, just, you don't have to, to go out to a surgery. And uh, they, they clip the excess tissue, then they take this needle out, I mean, it's kind of big needle, out, and they put a Band-Aid on and you go home, and your back, back feels pretty good. That company is going still down, going big guns. And then with our aging population, there be yeah, a lot that, of back that, that's problems. That's part of it. That is part of it. That's exactly, yeah. That's part of it. Part of their marketing study. Yeah, yeah. We have one in the IoT area, Internet of Things. Uh, one in the software area. They're the kind of new technologies that are you know, trying to kind of penetrate the market. But they're not hardware, really. I mean, they're, they're more like services and, and software rather than hardware. Um, so. Not every deal we, we made was a good deal. You know, I mean, in venture business, you always hope that if one out of ten investments you make hits it big, you can make up for all the losers. But in reality, if you make ten investments, normally maybe one or two really do well, about maybe four or five do okay, the rest shut down. And that, that, that's really fairly accurate, you know, fairly accurate. So we've had our share shutting down as well as <laughs> all those categories. Um, so you, you started it as a, a request, a requester for venture capital, very successful, ran a company, now you're sitting on the other side. That's right. People coming now to you. What would you like? Can you can you share some advice about uh, well, you know, you what always, you've learned and what you try to? Tell you us? always say, say the following: If you have a good idea, a good team, and the money needed to to execute, you get the business going. Very often you have maybe a good idea, but question if the team is strong enough or not, and then. Nowadays, we're the source of the money, so we want to make sure that we're investing in the right team, the right idea, and the right team. And so when people come with an idea, I very often, if you, you saw my, the, the business plan I have put together many, many years ago, it's kind of detailed about what it's going to take to make this happen. I see many deals where people, a couple of guys have a good idea, and, but they really don't have more than a good idea. A good idea by itself is, doesn't go yet, doesn't take you any place. If you find a real good idea and you like it, like going back to the leasing, leasing business, you work in bringing into the company talented people who can help execute if they don't. So, uh, so you really gotta have all those three pieces together. When somebody comes over and says, look, I have this fantastic idea, uh, I wanna build this product to do such and such with it, you know, you ask them the question, well, who are you going to compete with? What do you think you can succeed? How much is it going to take you to do this job? Who else, you know, with you? I mean, basically, so people have to really think about the whole, what's needed to be able to do a venture or make a venture become a success. Very often, they're so carried away with the idea is, I want to do such and such. It's a big market. I like it. Who's going to do it with you? How are you going to achieve it? How much money do you need? 
I find very, very often very few ideas that can pass that, that stage. They, they end up falling apart because you, they're not well thought out. Obviously, there are some good ideas. Today, as you hear these companies, before you know it, they have successes. They sold for a huge amount of money. You say, well, how did they get those ideas? And who actually came up with this? I'm sure they do exist, obviously. There are a lot of venture companies out there, a lot of people with ideas. Everybody becomes an entrepreneur nowadays. I mean, my every, every college, every community, any place, they have entrepreneurs all over the place. How do you get the right ideas and ex try to make something out of them? That's not easy. You have many, I used, we used to talk about that if you make 10 investments. Nowadays, maybe you need to make many more than that to get a few good ones. And that's tough. That's a tough business. There are too many losers out there, is what I was trying to say. So are you an early investor in your business strategy? Yes, we are. Strategy? We put the initial fund again. Okay. Yeah. But, but it doesn't stop there. You put the initial funding, and then six months later, a year later, they need more money. You either participate or you expect it to participate. What I mean by that is you get somebody else from the outside to invest. Say, so how about the insiders? Are they going to invest also or not? So you can't just say, I put the initial money in. They have a name for that once, who angel investors, they put some money in and that's all the money they're gonna put in. Uh, they're not gonna come in later on when the company needs more money. Very often they don't. We find ourselves doing that. Initial money plus second money and maybe third. Sometimes more than that, which is a mistake, but <laughs> we've done that too, you know. It's kind of fun, but it's not easy. But the, you're not retired, so why not do it? Oh yeah, yeah we, we, I'm doing it, doing it. But I keep looking for and I hear about you know new ideas and what have you. I mean, the last investment we made was about to, about a year ago. I mean, we're not. At one time, we had 12, uh, 12 investments going concurrently. Now we have five, which is, you know, fine. Um, somehow you often hear about the venture folks in the Bay Area. It seems like they love to invest in the Bay Area. They don't go outside the Bay Area to invest. So you find local people here and other places local venture people who invest in these lo different locations. Um, but, but I think um, you're going to see more good ventures, more good companies being built by people who do a good job in going after a market. And you're always thinking about what is the next growth area that's worthwhile pursuing. You know, there's always something. I mean, we talked about electric cars. Now you hear about the Chinese, say in a few years from now, they want to have 50% of their cars to be electric. What goes in an electric car? Batteries. Who's doing what in the batteries? I mean, you start thinking about those kind of ideas of saying, well, what could happen in this area or that area and so on. The same thing applies to other fields as well. You know. 